expect them to be. Well, they will stopped. be. That's kind of um, what's in there is a core plastic and grog core because you can't pour bronze as solid. Yeah, uh, I do. The shrinkage is in. Are we filming? Can we just take this? Just two seconds. Yeah. Hello. I'm okay. Right. Give, give, yeah, if you can, but make it after after three thirty, because uh, I'm busy now until three thirty. Cheers. Thanks ever so much. Bye. I'm supposed to be road testing a the car. They've been trying to get this car to me, for me since Monday, and every day it's been Tuesday, then Wednesday, and then yesterday it says, "Well, we'll give you a ring tomorrow," and it's just up the road, but I don't know. <laughs> So is that a different sort of wax in that? Yeah, well, it's the same wax, but in a different state. So look, these are the... These are some oh. ones we've done. Okay. That's Keith. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, we've had boys. So what do you put in the water for? It's very soft, and basically, Joey fell off the table. <laughs> and uh, so I thought we'd better... They're protected in the water, basically. Right. They're very right. protected. It's the best, most secure place for them. Right. They get really susceptible to uh -huh. heat. Yeah. And um, if you lie them on the ground, they're so soft that they can just Would you can lose edges and stuff. So oh, right. having them suspended in, yeah. in water is the best enough. way. Yeah. 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 So these kind of baked potatoes are basically cores, which are plaster and grog, yeah. which is a kind of a fired ceramic powder, which makes them refractory, mm -hmm. heat resistant. Basically, um, I make little snowballs. And yeah. Dip them. In is wax. that all solid then? The yeah. The bit? No, there's yeah. It's got yeah. core in it. It's plaster yeah. core. Yeah. And then I dip the cores in in wax. So I get these wax skins. Right. And that's what we've got here. Yeah. And that is a harder wax, only because the, the wax company sent me a um, different type of wax, which was much much softer. And I was thinking, yeah. no, because when I do my figures, my little figures, my little, what they call my cats, they're often standing on two legs or something and. You stick them on a shelf in the corner, they just go to the floor, <laughs> especially in summer. Yeah. So when you make, when you order waxes, you get summer waxes, winter waxes. Right. So a winter wax would be a softer wax. Yeah. Because it's cold yeah. and you want to yeah. get it malleable. Yeah. And a summer wax would be harder. And this is soft, so I think this is a, a winter wax. When I was worried, I thought, oh no, it's going to be far too soft. Mm -hmm. You do like a bit of resistance. Yeah, so it's not this. like a candle wax then? No, it's, a, it's microcrystalline, which is like a kind of petroleum. Mm -hmm. And um, it used to be beeswax. Oh, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Paraffin wax is candle wax, and that's very um, flaky. Yeah. If you did this, it, well, you wouldn't do this, but mm -hmm. if you did, it just shaves off and crumbles and yeah. it's very unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. So you have to have mixes. And when I first went to did my kind of training, you actually had to make your own recipes. So you had um, earth waxes, paraffin waxes. Yeah. So that was um, just trial and error. Yeah, and yeah. you mix them up yeah. to get what you call slush waxes, which are the waxes you pour into the moulds mm -hmm. to make the sculptures in the, in the, in the first place. Yeah, yeah so they are, and they, those recipes will date back you know, 500 years. You know. Yeah. yeah. So we had rosins, rosins, which is resinous. Resinous wax, and we used to have to runners and rises are these pouring channels. You you get the um, bronze to the moulds with, so you have channels on these. Yeah. Leading to a cup, and the cup they go in a kiln, and this all melts out, leaving a space which is negative. Yeah. And then you pour bronze into that channel, and it fills this up. But those channels are called uh, runners and rises. One lets yeah. the air in, and one lets the lets the bronze in, and one lets the air out. It's like yeah. plumbing. Yeah. And um, this rosin was something you, we have moulds now, and we pour this wax into, we get these tubes, and we just carry on. But when we first started, it was you had to get really old, mate, which is to make this rosin, which is like a putty, a bit of mm -hmm. resinous putty. You have to roll them out like sausages, and you spent the whole morning rolling out these incredible that long thin. That's stuff that time. Yeah. yeah. And then they were like brittle, hard, and you could just snap them and just work with them, and they were right. amazing. Yeah. But you know, all these things have 
don't happen anymore. Yeah. Times change, yeah. as yeah. you're well aware, yeah. Too right. which is yeah. why we're here. <laughs> yeah. 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 Change, yeah. So look, you're, uh, what's your, your story is, you were obviously a minor mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah. Had you had a multivarious career <clears throat> or... Yeah, I, I mean, me, me, when I left school, I started as a, uh, I served my apprenticeship as a motor mechanic. So, uh, took me city and gills as a motor mechanic and but, uh, we moved, we lived in Retford in Nottinghamshire. Oh, right. Uh, and my mother wanted to move to Doncaster, so I ended up packing in at the garage and coming to Doncaster, and we lived literally 200 yards over there. Really? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, the house still there? Yeah, yeah. And the, uh, I just wanted to earn money. Yeah. And at that time, cheers, Dan. Uh, at that time, uh, mining was a bit better money than being what a mechanic. Time, what time is this? 71 I went down. I started, I was 19 I went down. But I was earning roughly about maybe £5, £6 a week at the garage. And I think after I'd completed my training, I was on about £20 a week, something like that, £25 a week. So it was a big increase in your wages. God. Just from... In, from well, three or four times. Yeah. Yeah, straight away. Oh, was that, a f a f I mean, at the time, was that like a known kind of, that was a it was, main attraction? It, it was a, yeah, I think so. Everyone yeah. goes, if, if you can get, if you can get yeah. down underground, yeah. you, you're making money. You, you earn some money. And mine, when I first went down, I mean, I just went down as a, as a basic uh, labourer, for want of a better word, yeah. uh, which is one of the easy jobs, which is just pushing buttons. Uh, and <clears throat> I did that for so long with the view that I want to earn more money. <laughs> Mm. And then I found out that you could earn more money by uh, carrying the girders down to the coal face, which was big, big heavy stuff. You know, you had to f f build in the yeah, rings. Yeah, RSJ you're talking about, eh? Yeah, yeah, so you'd carry them on your I mean, shoulders. heavy, heavy. What, mm. six foot lengths? Yeah, they're six foot curved, and then the, the curved piece on top, and all the materials and down there. what are they there. called? These are the arches that you yeah, walk through? Yeah, what are they the called? Girder, they're just rings. Rings? Yeah. Because someone... At Stainforth Club, yeah, got me, pulled me to the side, got me to the bar, and said, "This is what you want to make. Yeah, you want to make. Is it a ring erector? Ring. A yeah. bloke that puts the rings up?" Yeah. And he drew me yeah. the sculpture of a guy no, yeah. holding up the rings. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and so and you, that, you are that guy. Well, I, I, I used to do the, getting the materials to them. Right. So it, was, it used to be three of us, but that was even more money than the, the basic really? job. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so getting it to them, but it was. Donkey work, like it yeah, was yeah. hard work. Right. Uh, but I don't know how it came about. But they, I must have been talking at some point, other than they knew I was a like a qualified fitter mechanic. Yeah. So the head fitter came and approached me one day, and he said, uh, "Will you come and work on my team?" And straight away I said, "Well, what's money like?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was more money again. So. Well. So uh, that's how I ended up on fitting team and. Uh, I mean, I did shifts for so long, but not. They wanted somebody who uh, they could rely on for days regular, and that was <coughs> going down pit at five o'clock every morning. Mm. Uh, and we all do was oh, minus nine times out of ten. There'd only be one fitter on each shift, you see, for each coal face. Uh, and they'd probably work for two and then have a day off, and then work for one and have another day off. So there was always short of men on the days and this is when things like market men get involved is it yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so basically I, I started for the first well for the rest of time I was the uh, he knew he could rely on me going out mm. of every day six days a week yeah. uh, so if there was anybody short on whichever coal face they sent me <coughs> right and, and I just called that shift or next two shifts and then went home uh, and that's if, ever, if all the coal faces were staffed up, uh, it, it'd send me wherever, you know, different places down the mines, doing different jobs, uh, and that's how I just progressed from it. So you became a known figure? Mm, yeah, I was... I think they could... They, they knew I would turn up every morning, whatever. Yeah. And I, I used to walk literally from the house down to bus station, uh, and, I mean, bus station's still there now, to be fair. It's changed a lot, but I used to walk there at 
five o'clock in the morning and you'd come up out of pit at quarter past one you see so you've got rest of day to yourself and rest at night right. but it, it was tiring going up at four mm. in the morning every morning six days a week yeah. but uh, I enjoyed it, to be fair. Yeah, I used to work every Saturday as well. Uh, that so used to be the, time and hour. You're seriously motivated. I was for money. Where does that? So yeah. really, I mean, it was all your money. ambition, your intention, your yeah. everything was money. I mean, yeah. is that what was the reason for that? Is it because you hadn't had it in the past? The family yeah. hadn't had it. No. You knew what life was like without money. Yeah, top risking. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we lived at uh, when we moved here. There was just me, my mother, and my sister. And my sister what just had father? a baby. They divorced when Good. I was nine. Uh, right. So they were just me, my mother, and my sister, and we were just in a rented house just around the corner. Well, it sounds to me as like you almost had the sense of responsibility as well. Well, it, yeah, because there was only me working. Mm. Yeah, uh, so you kind of became the man of the house mm. at the yeah. age of nineteen. Nineteen. Yeah. So the motivation wasn't entirely money. Well, I, I wanted, uh, I wanted a car, and right. I wanted things, and so when you, you, you only get things like that if you work. So as a son going home at night with your wage packet, mm -hmm. do you go to your mum, here's my wage packet, or do you go, here's mum, I'll give you fibre. No, I'll give you I'm going to buy packet. a car. Really? She, she got me wage packet for, I would say, for probably the first six, 12 months. Right. Mm. And how did that feel? How did it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't really know anybody. I didn't know anybody in Doncaster full stop, so I weren't into going out. It right. didn't bother me. And uh, I just looked at it as it's a roof over my head and it's Ford feeding logic. us and yeah, you know, and things will progress, you know, if you work out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I was telling Danny one particular story because when I first went out mines, I, I knew so we'd only just moved to, to Doncaster. Mm. I didn't know anybody. Nobody knew me. Mm. And whenever they saw me on pit top, they didn't recognise me because I used to have long hair. But whenever I was out pit, you used to have to wear an air net, and I used to oh, stick all mine in my helmet. <laughs> so they never ever recognised me. So you a bit of a glam rocker? Yeah, just a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> at, at I'm building a nice picture here. At Brodsworth Pit, there was, uh, it was a big, really big car park. So you'd come up out of the pit on, on, your, on the Friday, whatever ship you was on, and you'd take your lamp check, you'd go up to wages window, and they'd give you your, your wages. And then I'd make my way over to the car park, catch bus home. And uh, and this particular Friday, uh, I picked my wages up, and I had a quick look at them, and walked across the car park. It was dark, mm -hmm. uh, and there's hundreds of people walking across this car park. So at its peak, I think there were about two thousand miners that worked at Roddy. Yeah, and uh, I got to the bus stop, and the bit. 100, 200 people all there were queuing for buses as they were coming in and they, uh, <coughs> as bus came in I went to get my money out there and I'd lost my wages oh, uh, Gosh. and I just couldn't believe it I mean, it's just nothing in my pocket well I started panicking uh, and I'd come out of queue and walk back across car park and it's, it's, it's dark and there's loads of people crossing car park and what have you and anyway uh, I found my wage slip and my wage packet, but nothing in it, obviously. Mm. Uh, well, I felt like crying. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I bumped into somebody who I knew, and he, were, and he come and helped me look for it, and we walked all over the place, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, never ever found it. And, uh, I mean, <coughs> the pit used to be at Woodlands, which is, I don't know, five or six miles away, but... So I'd got no money to get back home. Mm. And he says, come on, so I'll give you a lift home. And anyway, I had to come home and tell me, Mum, that's oh, no shit. money. And, what have you. Uh, and I hadn't been down pit very long at that, that point. And, and nobody really knew me on cold face. Mm. That was it. Because uh, if you was on, on three shifts, you get to work with that team of, of men, week in, week out, whatever shift you're on. It's the same team of men. Mm. We, as I was, I was... I was on it. I never really worked with the same team a lot of times. I just oh, worked on my own. Yeah. And anyway, when I went back to work the week after, uh, this lad had obviously told somebody else and somebody else and what have you. And all the people who was on that shift with me on that particular week, they all put yeah. money in, every single one of them. And none of them knew me. 
Yeah. Uh, but I was on their gang, so to speak. I yeah. was on their shift, and I ended up probably with double wages wow. that week because everybody there weren't anybody went put anything in, uh, and they didn't know me from Adam, but that was just sort of what we were like. That's uh, incredible. And because I'd lost my wages, <laughs> and then, and as well as obviously being in a great, I mean, just you suddenly become a part of a family. Right. Yeah. yeah, that moment. Yeah. Totally. In. Oh yeah, totally. And uh, and Lord, he and I know, just thanked every one of them, and uh, it was just unreal to me because I just never expected anything like that at all, uh, and I never ever forgot that. You know, it was just for somebody who you're not used to having that sort of thing done to them. It was it was just you know it was special. You remind me of when I was in um, on holiday in France, and we went to the. Uh, Louvre Museum. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And we were in there, and I had my money, obviously. I was in the shop. We got out, got into a taxi with a family, all of the family got into a taxi. And um, just about to start off, and I just checked my, my wallet had gone. Mm-hmm. Oh, bugger. So I said, Look, taxi driver, I'm really sorry, the wallet's gone. Damn, yeah. damn, damn. I've got a family, I've got to get the other side of Paris. <laughs> no money, no yeah. cars, nothing. Yeah. Sugar. And uh, the guy said, Whoa. I said, Look, can I just run into the Louvre, which yeah. is closing? Yeah. So I go, uh, Ran to the to big glass pyramid, right. <laughs> knocked on the door of a <laughs> like like an alien thing. Yeah. Like knocked on the door of this pyramid, and there was a cleaner in the bottom. Go, what do you want? Yeah, bugger off, you know. I said, no, no, I need to get in. So I, in the end, after about half an hour, he let me in. I said, oh, my wallet's gone. My wallet's gone. I need. I really need to find that. Can I go to the shop and see if I left it at the till? Yeah. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. So they had to call security, and it went on and on and on for an hour. And made the top guy of security eventually came down because it would not move. My kids and family were in a taxi outside, <laughs> and uh, I think, what the hell am I going to do? So, um, basically, guy comes down, we look around, no wallet, and uh, I just, you know, beside myself. Yeah. The cleaner, once the guy's gone, he says, you better go now. I says, yeah, I suppose so. And the cleaner goes, um, how are you going to get home? I said, I have no idea. Yeah. And he got his money out, got his wallet out, and he gave me um, 30 euros. Yeah. I said, no, don't do that, don't yeah. do that, don't, 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 no, you have my money. He said, no, I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't. He goes, have my money. I said, no, no. He said, look, when I was in Saudi or something, he was a French, but he was yeah. making it so, an Englishman got me out of a big load of trouble in the desert, mm-hmm. and I've always said that I will, whenever repay I see someone in that. trouble, I will repay it. Yeah. And he says, here's the money. It's not because of you, it's because yeah. of what happened to me. And I went, oh, God. Incredible. Oh, Jesus. So I... Uh, Thank you. Emotional. Got, yeah. <laughs> got into the taxi and we went off to northern Paris and this guy in the taxi had been waiting for us for all night, lost all his fares. About 10 o'clock at night we got, eventually got there and I said, thank you so much. Here's a money. This guy gave me the money yeah. and it's just brilliant. I don't know how much it is, but please yeah. take it. He says, I don't want your money. I said, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 this is not how it works. Yeah. He goes, no, 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 you go home. I said, no, please. Yeah. You know, I can't handle this generosity, yeah. you know. And he wouldn't let it take me money. So I had this yeah. guy's money. So you got, and well, I you got had a free ride yeah, over well. Yeah, what am I going to do? <laughs> so now, uh, the, law, the law is now, this is an opportunity. Every time I have an opportunity, I tell someone the story. Yeah. And if I'm lucky enough or unlucky enough to come across someone who is asking, mm-hmm. I, I make sure I tell them this story yeah. and then I give them the money. Yeah. And it kind of, car- just like your story, yeah, that's right. it kind of yeah. carries on yeah. Yeah. in a strange way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So then you were working, I was almost freelance underneath. Yeah, it's like on, the, on the each coal face, they'd only have, for each shift, they'd only be one fitter. Uh, and a fitter is basically an engineer, are you just making sure nothing's going wrong with the conveyors? Yeah, if, the, if the machine breaks down, you're under pressure to get it fixed quick, because yeah. <laughs> they don't like it, yeah. they're not making money if it's not cutting. Yeah. So it's basically, uh, uh, while ever it's working, you might not be doing anything, right. uh, or you could be doing something else what they've already been allotted to do. Uh, so the duration of the shift, you could be working somewhere else. If it breaks down, you have to get to it pretty quick, and you, you might be a mile, mile and a half, two mile away, and you yeah. can hike there quick and, and get it moving again. And uh, But you do work on your own. If there's any heavy work and you needed somebody like a labourer to do some heavy lifting or whatever, you'd, you'd commandeer or whatever. But yeah, you're pretty much on your own. 
So do you have a place you're sitting in? I mean, you're waiting in an office type thing or a oh, bo- God, booth no. or are you, what, what are you doing? You're just sort of biding your time? Sat on lumps of coal, maybe. Literally, literally just <laughs> sitting you'd, there? Well, you'd be, you'd be work, they'd, making yourself useful. They'd have something for you to do without yeah. any doubt because as each shift started, there'd be a, the, the deputy or the foreman, for want of a better word, who would... Or can you do this? Or can you tighten this up? Or can you do it? They'd be finding yeah. jobs for you. Uh, uh, so just keeping things ticking over and to make sure hopefully it doesn't break down. Yeah. So you, you're always busy. Yeah. Always busy. But most of your work would be done in the 20 minute break when they stop for the right. snack. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then if there was any sort of serious maintenance work, you'd have 20 minutes to get it done while, while they're not cutting. Mm. Uh, and go on with it. Well, that's why we used to work nearly every Saturday because it was sort of maintenance and things like that where mm. they didn't, didn't tend to cut coal on at the weekend. You could get down there and do what you needed to do. But I can remember one there, uh, I was telling Danny about it, there was, I'd, been, I'd been working down there a while and they, sent, they wanted me to go down to another scene, another coal face, further down and about half a mile down. But it was a low coal face, very low. Uh, so down. deep? About eye to these chairs. Oh, he's in the face. Right, yeah. Bloody hell. Really? Yeah, yeah about that. Uh, so it's 200 yards long. That's because there's not enough coal above it. It's just the, the depth of the coal yeah, seam. Right, right, yeah. you know, it, there was, like Barnsley seam, it was, could be about five or six foot high yeah. of a stream of yeah. coal. Uh, the Dunstall and Thorncliffe seam could only be. Maybe that time. Jesus Christ. Uh, and I took this apprentice down and got this apprentice with me for the day. And it was about five mile out, four or five mile out. And then you had to hike another mile to Coalface. And this Coalface was sealed off in so much as that nobody was working on that. They just wanted, uh, they needed bits of equipment off it, which is I see. a bit more valuable. So they'd send me down. I'd dismantle it all, unbolt this, unbolt that, take all hydraulics off and leave it there and then next shifts two or three men would go down and, and take out what I've unbolted mm. and dismantled. Uh, but this cold face is like 200 yards long uh, and you laid on your belly. Wow. For the, so you had to crawl along the cold face and you had to move your gas mask to one side and your battery to the mm. other mm. and just drag your tool bag along it from one and just dis- dismantling different things as we were going along. Mm. But all the time, the weight's coming on. You know, the roof's caving in ra- around you. You, you in, you're under the chair sort of thing, but it's caving in at the back of you, so it's, it's loud. <laughs> what? It's, it gets loud. So you've gone in, let's just go back a little step here. You've gone into a lonely tunnel, basically by yourself, which is disused. No, I've got an apprentice with me. And you've got a, a little boy with you. <laughs> and you're away from the teams, because they're in yeah. another district. Yeah. So there's an incredible sense of loneliness, I suppose, in a mm. sense. Oh, it's quiet. An uh, incredible sense of impending kind of danger and doom. And you're walking into a... How deep is this? You're, you're laid on it. You said about a chair, didn't you? Yeah, it's, you'd, you'd luch, literally eye to that chair. You'd be, you'd be laid and you'd pull yourself along with your battery in your, in your tool bag. 200 yards. Uh, and that the pe- where at the back of the chair, that's what caves in behind you. Whenever, oh, whenever give me a break. <laughs> whenever no, they- no, no. <laughs> You're joking. It's like a living tomb. It's dark. Yeah, it's dark. But you, it's just just what you're used to. You, you just get on with it. But while you while you're under there, you you safe. As long as well, what's all this breaking down, collapsing business then? Where's all that? Well, as the coal face, the, the back of the coal face. Yeah, as you move, as the coal face is moving. As, you're, as that's going forward and the 200, a lot of these supports oh. that you're in, yeah. as that moves forward, everything behind, call it gob. In the gob. That just caves in. So, okay, just, so, okay, so say the chair's a tunnel, the yeah. back of the chair's the gob. Yep. Yeah. So there's a big cave behind you, yeah. and as you're walking along, crawling you've got a wall on your right-hand side, which is the face. You're going yeah. out, crawling and crawling along yeah. your belly. Yeah. That side of the face is going crack, crack, full, yeah. full, and it's down over there, 100 yards ahead of you, 100 yards behind, you yeah. hear... Yep. And then you carry on, and you go... Yep. And you go, where's the... Yep. Is it? it. And then you carry on, and it's like... Nothing. 
So there's an incredible kind of nervous tension. But you're used to it, so you're not. Yeah. So you just go on, yeah. But there aren't, are there any props under this thing? Is there any reason why the gob should collapse and not the coal face that you're in? Yeah, you're, un you're under You're the under a bridge of yeah. protected steel. steel. I got steel. ramps, yeah. They're, on, they're yeah. still in place? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm yeah. feeling a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> So so it, sometimes it didn't drop straight away, didn't you? Oh, so yeah, it could be, some, could be two moved. minutes after, it could be two hours after, it could be two days after. You could peer into the back into the gob and you could just see a big open cavern and you're just waiting for that boom as it comes down. Uh, and then the dust. Yeah, oh, yeah. And the pressure of air, I presume, yeah. Yeah. coming it's into loud. wafting you. Is it yeah. hot air? Yeah. Cold air? Yeah. So it's, it's, like usually, a warm... it's hot on coal face. Mm. Right. So it was like... where we were, but some, like the drift line where Keith worked, the Keith, uh, he was, it was cold down his mine, but I and just... What, what's the reasons for different temperatures? And why, why would you be hot and he'd be cold? His was a drift mine, so you, he what's walked into mine? it. Uh, like egress. A slope. So you were talking about egress, wasn't he? You yeah, walked, that's... You walked up the egr egress. Yeah. Uh, you, you're walking down to it, like with a coal mine, you know, a, a, a deep shaft mine. The reason you'll have two uh, two shafts, the top of the one which is like sealed is like a big fan and it'll pull all the air, all the stale right. air around the mines and there'll be different air doors and what have you, so it keeps that air circulating all the time. If that fan ever breaks down, you so have to breathe. <laughs> it's a bit like my runner and rider system in the yeah, wall. Yeah, so exactly. Runners going in, yeah. air coming out. Exactly. So I push points in whatever. Yeah. You, someone has designed, obviously designed, yep. this ventilation system, yep. which is uh, and it goes around miles and miles of, and a massive fan at yep. one point will be pushing air in. Put, it's dragging it up, so it's dragging it down the open, oh, okay. open shaft, and expelling it out of the closed shaft, and in different places to keep that air regulating the lab, what they call air doors, and when you open them, you could feel the air, but your ears would pop when you open them, it's like going up in a plane. So uh, could you cause damage? to the mine or to yourself if you were not qualified and understood the opening and closing of doors? Oh yeah, you've got to make sure that you close the doors, without a doubt, yeah. Right. Uh, some of the air doors was propped open maybe with a piece of wood, maybe two inches, six inches, eight inches, and that was all done to regulate the airflow into different parts of the pit. So was there specific characters um, charged with controlling air? No, no. There was no one whose no. job was to make sure air no. was flowing? No. No, you were just down to, Common just down sense. to you, yeah, yeah. That, if, that door, if that door was closed, you'd make sure you close it afterwards, after you've gone through okay, it. Gotcha. Uh, and if it was half open, you'd leave it that way. Right. But a lot of them, that some of the doors, if you got to it and it was fully closed, no matter how strong you are, you wouldn't be able to open really? it. It is that stiff, so there'd be like a sliding door on it, which is like a sliding window. Mm. And it just like a rabbit hook, and you just open that, it'll allow a bit of the pressure because you can then pull the door wow. open, close that, and then back in again. I think, I mean, do you, I mean, did you ever get kind of um, reflective over the fact that the power of air moving through oh, this? Oh, yeah. Do you ever yeah. think about the it's, fact that this is almost like a life force? It's keeping you alive. <laughs> it's the, the force of it is, you can't describe on that. But the, if you was at the bottom of the shaft where they're drawing the air in, and for the first mile or so, it's cold, because obviously it's the oh. cold air what's coming down. Yeah. But if you was at the other end of the spectrum, the bottom of the out, you know, the shaft where it's drawing it up, it's, it's all the stale warm air, and that's where it's hot. Wow. Uh, so it, it, depending where you are in the mines, you could be working in an hot place or a cold place. Jeez. The masks you wear, those, those uh, kind of packs on the back and the, the cord, like, I always like them because they're like a the spot of the light. Yeah. The, that's yeah. the light pack. <coughs> yeah, you have your lamp on there. Uh, and basically, you'd run the cable down under your arm and then into your battery. Uh, I mean, there's another story about that. <laughs> My battery, for a couple of three days, every time I was down at down mine, I couldn't understand mine, my legs was itchy. And burning. Top and bottom of my battery had burst and it was battery oh. acid where it had been no. leaking down my leg. Uh, and whether it's right or wrong, I mean, I, I hadn't been down there long and it, it 
just a crack had appeared and all acid had leaked down my leg and it was burning my leg and one of these miners came up to me and he says you know the best way to to neutralize it and I says no that's no idea he says uh, he said we'll all pee on you <laughs> I just had some <laughs> pull up with bloody birdies. <laughs> but yeah, the, the battery had, uh, had cracked. And it, I mean, the big heavy batteries, but yeah, it had all it had burnt side of the back of my trousers down my leg. Yeah. But the, the, the mask, the gas mask itself, I mean, I never ever opened mine. We knew what it was like inside, but they were self rescuers of the gold, and it was just for you that if you needed it for gas or anything like that, and you'd, you'd crack it open and, and wear it, but touch wood, I never ever wore mine. <laughs> yeah. What were you wearing under, underground? For working? Yeah. A pair of shorts. So a pair of shorts. And that was it, and then my belt. I'd have my two adjustable spanners on my belt and an hammer, uh, and that was it. So when you're crawling along this floor, Mm-hmm. In short, no knee pads. No knee. Are <laughs> no, you literally um, <laughs> scuffing, cracking, scratching, grazing, yeah, cutting you yourself the whole way? Well, you try to uh, you try to alleviate, try, yeah. alleviate the yeah. effect, but yeah, no, nevertheless, can. there is. Yeah, you, you get a few sharp grazers. Floor yeah. yeah. With a load of hot air collapsing and wafting along as in yeah. various geological circumstances. You know, I mean, it's. If you thought about it, you probably wouldn't do it. No, well, you, you just uh, like if we was going to dismantle something, I'd just have it in my mind as I'm crawling along where I'm heading to, what yeah. what I'm going to be doing, so get what, it done what, with, and go out with. Just as a bit of fun, what's the longest distance you crawled on your belly? In those I would say probably 200 yards from one end of coal face to other. Yeah, because normally most coal faces they're not much longer than that. No, uh, and out of interest. From a mine's point of view, if you've got a seam which is only as high as a chair, and you've got a seam that's six foot high, mm-hmm. is it easier and more economic to have a big high seam, or is it faster work, do you get more coal out than you would a small low seam? I would say it's probably going to be the same, because the coal cutting machines for a six foot high seam would be on like a ranging arm, and it's going up and down, cutting that six foot seam. And it's going at the same speed right. as that. So the gauge of the two tool, foot six seam. So the gauge of the cutting tool is yeah. about two foot six anyway. Yeah. So if it's a two foot six, it's, it's cutting the same taking, amount. Yeah. Yeah. So if they were going, if they're sending miners down a pit and there's like at Broadsworth, I think there was probably about eight or ten faces going at the same time or at different places. Right. Uh, so if they're all working at full capacity, uh, whether it's a two foot or three foot seam or a six foot seam. Mm you're still going to get a decent amount of return yeah. out of it. And so when you're mining, you're mining, you're the, the, the height of a chair, the granite, say, whatever it is above the coal seam, mm. the rock, is obviously getting narrower and narrower and narrower. Uh, is there a point of realisation you think, I can't... Because you obviously... It's a bit like, you know, there was this wonderful story I read once about a bloke carrying a pig up a hill. He says, you never carry a pig up a hill. It'll be impossible. It's like yeah. a big... You know, and the guy said, there is a way. He goes, oh, no, I don't know. He said, if you take a piglet up a hill, you yeah. can do it, can't you? Yeah. He said, carry on taking that piglet for the, you know, for the next yeah. month. So he took a piglet and a piglet and a piglet yeah. and a piglet and a piglet. And after a month, the piglet was twice the size and he was yeah. still taking it up. <laughs> yeah. And then he goes, carry on. And he carried on. And eventually, yeah. six months later, he was carrying a pig. Yeah. And he had noticed no difference. That's you know? right. yeah. It's a similar thing in reverse, because it's like, um, how do you, you, know, you get used to it and used to it and yeah. used to it and used to it? And used to it. Yeah. I mean, at what point do you go, this is now ridiculous, although I'm used to it, there is a point where it must stop. You must think, this now it's too low and too extreme. Well, if they got the equipment in there, uh, yeah. it was, you'd work in it, whether it's, yeah. whether it's two foot or ten foot, you, you know, you're just working it because it's, it's just what, what you did, it was I your s- job. I suppose there's a moment when the tool jams. And got that's the, the, thing that's the goes, worst part. All right, because yeah. imagine it could start on just cutting... Cu- granite as well oh yeah yeah so you could just carry on cutting and eventually go, oh, we're getting a bit of a shave here i mean the the, the on the rotary machine they'd have this picks all the way around like yeah. really sharp uh, the shearer tungsten yeah. the shearer and you'd have a like a special tool so at if it was struggling cutting through the granite and what have you uh, at, at break times you you quickly change quite change a few of, yeah yeah you'd change quite a few of the of the picks and there'd be 
you know, something similar to this size, what have you. And they'd be, and they're mounted in like a rubber, but you, you'd have like a special tool where you'd, you'd snap them out and put new ones in, uh, so it'd enable it to cut again better next shift. Right. But tell, you, um, tell Lawrence a story that you were telling us about um, the, the rock breaker. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Well, when the uh, obviously the the coal cutting machine is is going up and down all the time, and it's cutting, there could be lumps of coal or rock coming off the size of that table, mm. it, and they'll just drop onto the the metal panzer, yeah. which is dragging it along the coal face, and that drops onto another metal panzer before it drops onto a, a rubber conveyor belt. But so when it drops onto that second metal pan, the coal face is there. So when it drops onto that second metal panzer, which is coming this way, they have uh, a lump breaker, for want of a better mm. word. But this lump breaker is in a, a metal tunnel. A stone crusher. Yeah, but it's, it's like a rotating rotisserie. That's <laughs> yeah, okay. But on this rotisserie is this like pickaxe blades, and they're probably about a foot long, but there'll be about 30 of them on this rotating. It's about this wide, and it's rotating. Just steadily going round, so as all the rocks and the coal falls onto this metal panzer, it's just hitting this lump breaker all the time, mm. which it breaks it up into a manageable amount, so it falls onto the... Very noisy. Very noisy. Very dusty. And it's in a it's in a tunnel, right. about this high. But the bottom of the pick, or the picks, to the top of the conveyor belt is probably about that. So there's not much going to get through yeah. without it being broke up. Uh, and the times where that's when it's nerve wracking because you you would have to crawl down that tunnel to fix it. Nice. Uh, but you'd have your own padlock which you would snap onto the, the, the power for that particular rotating. Uh, you'd snap the padlock on, and there's only you got the key, and you'd then crawl along this tunnel. With There's no ending to it because all you can see is these blades just sticking down, which is for the lump breaker. So if you've got to go and change those picks, you, you crawl along there. And they'll just wind you up because they'll be tapping on, saying, "Power on now, power oh. on." Jesus. And you'd have to do it in that in the break time when that twenty minute break. So you, you'd be you'd be working fast to try and get in there and do it. And yeah. so you've probably got to crawl maybe maybe ten fifteen yards to this lump breaker with, and it's pitch black because it's it's oh, all enclosed. Sure. But you've got your light on. And then they just wind you up by saying they turn it power on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's. But you, you knew it was locked, but even then, you, you your imagination. Had, <laughs> you've got the key and everything on yeah. this padlock. So all the fitters and all the electricians would all have their own padlock and key. So if you ever needed to isolate something, you isolated it. There's only you got the key, so nobody else could go in and. They could, they could cut the lock off, but obviously not. Do yeah. That, yeah. So Jeez. if you was ever working in something, relatively dangerous that's what you'd do you'd isolate it and uh, and what have you but yeah <laughs> god yeah Bloody hell. you seem very um i suppose sanguine about it very philosophical about it it's um you obviously got a degree of pleasure out of that kind of extreme mm. uh, experience well, I think you didn't really know any different to no. be fair it's just that uh, you just go on with it uh, and it's it was just normal. It was just it was just normal. Right. Uh, How many years then did you actually? Six. Six was, years. Six years. Yeah. Uh, and so and then what happened? What did you do? I wanted to go out. I just didn't want to be coughing cold and stuff for the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted a better way. It used to be a pleasure coming up and uh, breathing fresh air. Right. And I, I think that was the the thing and. I used to see that many uh, people who were, had been 30 years, 40 years down the mines and, and they're coughing and they're hunched over and mm. really suffering with their health. And I thought there's got to be more to, 
to work in, in life than swallowing cold or stall shift. Yeah. Uh, so I just made a, a concerted effort to try and get out and I was just applying for jobs because I wouldn't just pack in and I wanted no. a job before I, I left and I'd just keep applying for jobs until I got a I got chance of one and, and just came out <laughs> and got out while I could. Mm. Uh, and was it... Um to be a part of that gang, that brotherhood, and those guys knowing you wanted to leave... They never knew. They never knew. Never knew. I never ever told them. If they did, how would that have been? I, th- I think majority of them uh, would have... And I think they'd have understood and said, good for you. Because I remember when I first went down there, the number of people that were saying, you yeah, know, you don't, don't be coming down here, you don't want to be... It's not a life for young people, this, that, and the other, you know. Right. Uh, I think that they would sooner... I know when I went on the... Uh, you have a month's training down the mines yeah. at Armthorpe, I did mine, just up the road. And I remember the, fir- the first time I went onto a coal face. So this instructor is taking you along a working coal face and there's like 10 or 15 new starters. And I can remember the number of miners that were saying, oh, you must be crackers coming down here, this, yeah. that and the other. Yeah. And, I mean, I only went down for money and that was yeah, it. Yeah. You know, it was a means to an end, uh, and just go out when I could. Yeah. But I think if, if truth be known, I mean, I never ever, there was only one person knew, and that's one of the lads who I used to work with, to the day I came out of it. I never told anybody I, that, that that was my last shift, nobody right. knew. Uh, and I just breathed a big sigh of relief when I came yeah. up that last yeah. time. <laughs> no sense of like, I'm um, away from the mates and away from the gang and away from I the didn't really know up. many, I didn't. Not as friends. Right. So despite as work this, colleagues, yeah. Despite the whip round and all the kind of yeah. the gestures and the con- and the, the I thought of me elf more yeah. than anything. And I just yeah. wonder if there's a not not the to stop you making a decision, but a pang give you gave you a pang. Oh yeah. I mean, it's I don't think you'd ever get work colleagues as I'm saying you as close and as loyal as that. But uh, I think you. But I health, just, health is important. Yeah. It was. Yeah. I mean, as, as you could be off for two weeks' holiday, and at the end of two weeks' holiday, if you were blowing your nose or coughing, you'd be still coughing cold and stuff mm. after after two weeks not being down there. <laughs> mm. uh, and I mean, the, the the people I worked with when I first went down there, they they'd got pneumoconiosis, which is like dust disease and things I like met, that. I met and someone on one of the talks. We had it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was horrendous, horrendous, uh, and. I mean, at that time, you never had, never had dust masks, or no. I never had a dust mask, or ear mufflers, or anything like that. You just they yeah. came out later. I mean, do you have things like tinnitus now? And I've, I've just well, I'm saying just last year, I just got paid out for industrial deafness. Have you? Mm, yeah. No yeah. hearing aids, in, no. but uh, you can hear me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can hear. I, I, I didn't even know I'd. My wife had complained. So. <laughs> but I used to, uh, I came off, I was mountain biking, it'd be about three years ago now, uh, and I, I, I came off in a big way and, and broke my collarbone and oh, really? I hit this tree. And I ended up, I, I got, it kept going, every time I sat up, I kept going dizzy spells, so I ended up going to hospital. And they diagnosed this, I can't remember what it's called now. But anyway, I dislodged some of the inner crystals in my ear. Mm-hmm. So when they tested my ears, they said, how long have you suffered with your hearing? So they didn't know I had. Oh. <laughs> they said, oh, he says, your hearing's terrible. Because you know, they'd done this hearing test. Uh, and they says, you, what's your job? And I told them. And he says, have you worked in an, ever worked in a noisy environment? I said, well, yeah. I, said, well, I used to work on coal fields. And they said, uh, asked me when it was. And they said, oh, it's probably that. So anyway, the, uh, when I came out, I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can get something yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there, there, or there was, was paying out for early miners. I mean, I know from sort of 1980s, I think they all had air defenders yeah, yeah. on and things like that, but we never had them. No. Uh, so, yeah, but they didn't get, I didn't get much like but it was worthwhile yeah, <laughs> pursuing yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Plus, you know, you suffered, genuinely suffered. Well, yeah, yeah. And I'm all right on a one-to-one, but if there was background noise yeah. and somebody were talking to me from behind and there was noise at front, I'd struggle. Mm. Mm. But in a quiet room, I, I don't have any no. problem. Yeah. So you can hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I struggled the other night when they were, they was, oh, they were yeah. talking to a lady at front and I couldn't hear her, or I could hear yeah. you, but I couldn't yeah. hear her, but I could hear you because I could see you. Yes, I see, yeah, that's interesting, <laughs> uh, isn't it? And, uh, but she'd gone back to me, so I couldn't yeah. hear her. And my son was telling me what, what she was saying. But, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I, uh, I enjoyed the time down there, but I was, I was glad mm. to get out. Uh, and I mean, it, it, as it turned out, I think the pit I was down, I think it closed about three years Right, so you were out uh, yeah, just uh, before the yeah before it the main demand do. for jobs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I what mean, did you go to? What did you do? <laughs> well, I, I, I got a job initially, fitting, still fitting, building uh, forty foot trailers, Arctic oh, right, trailers. Yeah. So I four Williams sort of thing. Well, no, it was it was York Trailers, the the actual firm, big big forty footers, and fitting uh, the big couplings on packer wagons and uh, mm. tractor trailer units. And while I was working there, I, I, got, a, I got offered a job <laughs> in finance. Really? Mm. Finance? And uh, I've done that for the last no. 30 years. What do you mean? Go on. What, what, how did you move? So what, how did they detect your financial acumen? This, this guy, who was, I ended up talking to at this particular time, he knew the girl I was going out with, his family. And I used to see him regularly, and he says, well, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? And at that time, I was working at York Trailers, uh, building trailers. I said, I ain't got a clue. I said, I, I don't know. I, I said, I've got no sort of dreams or ambitions. I, I said, if anything, I said, I don't want to be doing this. I said, but... Yeah. And he said, well, he says, why don't you come down and see me? And anyway, he offered me a position in his office, and I just progressed. Uh, so I ended up doing that for 30 years mm -hmm. <laughs> and ended up in my like, upper management and yeah, so I retired last year right. uh, and it, basically that was a forced retirement because there was, uh, they were doing restructuring in the company that I was working for. I'd been took over two or three times mm -hmm. but I always kept my, my position uh, and then there was uh, they were doing a restructuring uh, and I thought I'm just going to see what pensions I've got. Yeah. And I decided once I'd, I'd worked it out and I didn't you know, go oh, stuff it, I'm going to pack in. So, wow. so I, I just called it a day last year. Gosh. Yeah. Never looked back. Obviously, mountain biking. Well, I, I, I'm into motorbikes. I've got a, an old classic bike that I ride. Uh, I, I mountain bike and I run every day. Good Lord. Really? Every single day. Yeah. Uh, if it's today I mountain bike, tomorrow I'll run. And I just seem to alternate uh, running or cycling every Jeez. other day. So normally be half seven in the morning. I might either out running or mountain biking. Good lord! Uh, Are you living in the country? No, no. I live. Uh, I'm where we live. It, I mean, it's only a small town, but within within five minutes of running or cycling, I can be on a on a river bank yeah. and out into country. So yeah, it's not. Uh, it's not bad, but it's dead flat. Uh, it's, so it's a bit easy as regards running and cycling. But I, ch I try to do it every day. And then every Sunday, I go out with my son and we'll do either a run or a cycle together. Uh, hmm. A longer one. You know, maybe 10, 15 miles, something like that. How old are you? 66. Oh, OK. We <laughs> 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 ran the Three Peaks. We were talking about doing the Three Peaks Challenge. So we're doing a fundraiser for our second years to take up to Berlin. I said, I'm aiming to do it under nine hours. He said, oh, you'll smash that. He says, I ran the three peaks. And what was your time, Steve? 4.20. <laughs> 4.20. It's yeah. a marathon distance, yeah. practically. Yeah, it's about 24 what? and a half mile. 24 20. and a half mile over yeah. three peaks. Penny Gent. Uh, it's North not Yorkshire. It's North Yorkshire. It's Penny Gent. Ingleborough. Ingleborough. Yeah. Or Penny Gent, Wernside, Ingleborough. Yeah, Ingleborough's flat one, isn't it, I think, is it? I'm just, um, one of them's just dead flat. One side's a gradual. That's the one you set off from. You set off from Pennygent Cafe, don't you? Yeah. So yeah. Pennygent's the first one. Yeah. That's a bit of a scramble over. Yeah. And then one side, the low and slow up past the viaduct. Yeah. And then Ingleborough is, is the Death Mountain. Yeah, that's the dead flat one. Yeah. Yeah. But up to it is. Yeah. You, you, you can, yeah, he's yeah. climbing up. Yeah. Four yeah. hours climbing. Yeah. I don't even have to ride on a bike like this. You'd, 
You will, Dan. You will. You, you do it. Yeah. I mean, the, to be fair, the day we did it, we just did it on spur at the moment. Uh, I mean, we, but we was running 60, 70 mile a week anyway, every week. So we just... I didn't, I didn't come here to be intimidated. <laughs> we just thought we'd... There's a friend of mine, I mean, he used to walk it regular. So he knew, he knew it pretty regular. So he just all, all said, why don't we all do it one weekend? So we just went down there. As the cafe opened, because you clock in in the cafe. Uh, and we went in, clocked in, <clears throat> and set off. And we all just got a, a bum bag. We all food and everything in and just set off. I mean, we'd, we had no conceptions about a time or anything, but we just ran and enjoyed it. But we did run all the way. You know, we, we ran it non-stop. Uh, and we stopped at the top of each peak and had a bit something to eat and, and what have you, then just set off again. So you had a full course lunch as well? Yeah. I mean, it, there's a... Uh, really casual stop. <laughs> well, the <laughs> bottle of wine. One of the, the guys who did it is a... He was a writer for our club as well. Who we used to write the, the, uh, the press releases for the paper, uh, and that that's been a big joke because I had more food stashed into me, <laughs> into my bum bag carrying it round with me. <laughs> I had fruit cake and all sorts. Tried to, but you're not supposed. They advise you not to run it without uh, the correct clothing and things like that. And but we just did it in t-shirt and shorts. What, what time of year did you do? It? August. Oh, that's the difference. Yeah. That's why mine's going to take five hours longer. <laughs> We're looking at Feb. <laughs> <laughs> the last time we walked, actually, and uh, we got on top of Wormside, there's about three foot of snow on top of it. it yeah, I can imagine. It was dangerous. We were yeah. like, wow. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's a, I, I think it's a en lovely, enjoyable yeah. route that it is. But there's that many, when you're coming off the top of all three of them, you could go in virtually a lot of ways down. I mean, I know when we came off the second one, I mean, there were five of us doing it and we just, we was loopy because we were just all running down the side of this hill for about a mile, just going crackers in it. It was that steep. Yeah. You, you've got to keep running because yeah. otherwise you're going to go head over heels. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to try and, I'll, dig, I'll send you a couple of pictures of that. I, yeah. I, I, can, like I, said, we, I carried a camera around with me on that day and just to record it. So we took a yeah, I'd, uh, yeah, we've got some good pictures. Yeah. Oh, yes, you got some pictures down the mine, didn't you? Mm. <clears throat> I mean, it was, it was my last week, and I, we decide, <clears throat> I knew I was leaving because I, I, I was working my notice. And uh, uh, so they search you a lot of the times. You know, you, yeah, you're not supposed to take, obviously, you're not supposed to take a camera now. Uh, Purely and simply, I mean, it was a mechanical camera anyway. There were no batteries or anything like that, so it's not going to ignite gas. But I don't think they would have liked you taking the camera down. So this particular day, I, I took it down. But it was a film camera. It's 1977. Mm. But it was a film camera. Digital cameras weren't involved. Uh, with the view that I wanted some pictures of me down mine. <laughs> Uh, but obviously, it's pitch black. I mean, you yeah. you put your hand there and touch your nose, and you can't see. Wow. Well, yeah. So there's no flash, you can't use a flash down there. So <clears throat> the only way we could do it, and this friend of mine, we decided that I'd take three of him and he'd take three of me. So we had, we had to sort of brace it on a, a lump of rock. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to hold, shut it open with his finger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sat there, Waiting. not trying to move, yeah. while he gets the cap lamp and then he's just doing this oh, really? to try and light up all really? the area. But you, you sat there for, yeah, maybe, it could be a minute and a half or two minutes. I mean, I don't know. We were just guessing exposures. You're just guessing it. So you took three pictures <laughs> yeah. each. Yeah. And um, all three were very good yeah. exposures. <laughs> it's outrageous. Well, that, On a fully manual camera. It was fully manual. I mean, it, the focusing was manual as well. So it would sit there. It was out about from here to those... Uh, screens away from each other uh, but I took better pictures of, the, of him than he did of me because <laughs> <That's laughs> it, 
Because I'm sure he, he must have been moving camera slightly, because mine's a bit blurred. We concentrated a lot more on my face, so it's overexposed my face. If it had concentrated a bit more on outsides, it, it, my facial features would have been a bit better. But I got three pictures out yeah, of it, yeah. and that, that was more than enough. For, but his was really good. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, we didn't know till for about ten days after what they'd come out like, and by then I'd left it, so there, were, yeah. there were no second chance. And I, by the time we got them developed, and they'd come out okay, to be fair. So I was pleased with that. Uh, it's, uh, it's got to be about two minute exposure. It was Easy. some, Easy. yeah. Easy. I mean, it was black. pitch black, and it was just the the cap lamp, really. What? But you're trying to hold the camera whichever way with one hand, which shutter open. While you're doing cap lamp, it's like and bobbing your head and tapping your belly or whatever, yeah, and moving all this round and trying to keep that s without moving. And while you're sat there, and whatever pose you're in, you can't move either, yeah. <laughs> and just sit there for a couple of minutes. But yeah, they didn't come out too bad, to be fair. Yeah, yeah we're pleased with them. Have you told Lawrence about the uh, the shift that you worked, the never ending shift? Yeah. Oh yeah, there was <coughs> there was many a time because I was. You're five mile out, and <clears throat> so by the time you're due to leave your place of work, the next shift are already down the pit, right, ready to travel. And you, you'll pass each other mm. halfway, it was like a passing station. Uh, but if that fitter hadn't turned up for the next shift, <clears throat> they'd phone down to you and say, Do you fancy doing a double, you know, double shift? And uh, nine times out of ten, if it was, it was there, I'd do it, uh, yeah. just for money. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you'd basically get back to work again. And so at the end of the second shift, same again. So you, where I was working this particular day, it was, you're five mile out, but you was only maybe three or four hundred yards away from the place you would walk to, to catch the train back yeah. out. <clears throat> so, the end of the shift, you, you know it's end at shift because people are saying, right, we're on his way, blah, blah, blah. And I, I made my way to the end of this tunnel yeah. to wait for the train to take me back out at the end of my double shift. And only to know that, find out that it had gone without me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the only way you can get out is... Walking. On that, well, it's on that next yeah, train, yeah. but they wouldn't allow you to walk along the, the train no. line sort of thing. So I ended up doing a treble shift that Lucky day. Hell. So I was, was like 24 uh, hours, 24 hours? About 18 and a half hours I was down Jesus. there. <laughs> and by then my mum were, she'd folk pit up because I'd gone down 18 hours before and I'd come home. And, uh, and you have you, you like your checks where you, yeah. it would be hung up and the check to see I was still down there. And they yeah. said, well, he's still at work. Well, he shouldn't be. Well, he is. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, I did about 18 and a half hours. <laughs> I remember that one. It was a long time. I had following day off though. I didn't go in but that following day. No. Did you get physical tiredness or did you just... So there's a sense of adrenaline down there, is there? I, yeah, I didn't, really, I didn't really think too much about it. I just yeah. carried on working. Yeah. And uh, once I knew that I couldn't go out, I yeah. might as well just make the best of it and carry on working. So uh, when you left then, um, uh, so did the relationship with your mother carry on in the sense that you carry on? For how many... All those years were you still... Was the arrangement the same? Oh, no. Once, once I'd started earning decent money, I just used to pay a board. Right. Yeah, and uh, my ways, and bought my own car and what have you, and mm. just progressed from that. So what was your mother's life like? I mean, in the sense of when you... Say, for example, you left and you got your other job and you... And was she on... How was she surviving? Benefits. Just benefits. on benefits. She'd never worked for just uh, health problems. And right. she'd never worked... I would say since I was 15, right. uh, she'd stopped working due to health problems, so yeah, it was just on benefits. Yeah. So when I left home, uh, it was just her and my sister, yeah. still at home then. And what did your mother do before she was...? Worked in an office yeah. at, in Redford at a rubber works factory. She was in offices. Rubber yeah. works factory? Yeah, it was Northern Rubber it used to be called, in a uh, big rubber manufacturer in Nottinghamshire.
in fact, all my family worked there, apart from me. Yeah. <laughs> they, all, they all ended up... That was the main... In Retford, that was the main... Yeah. The equivalent to the pits in Doncaster, yeah. I would say. It was the main uh, workplace in, uh, in Retford. Who's the problem? One hour, okay. I feel a little bit. You've got a good head, don't mind me saying. Yeah. I've just got to square it up a bit. Yeah. One of the things what used to be, uh, I'm not saying ever, I don't think you ever get used to it, was the uh, was actually going down in the cage. That's, mm. uh, I mean, ours was a, was a big, it was a big cage, still 140, 70 on each level. People? Yeah. So, and it's like a two-tier cage. Good. But uh, it was a big pit, it was a big mine. Yeah. But the, if you ever went down, if you was on the first drop, so to speak, after they'd been drawing coal, because while they're drawing coal, it's up and down as fast, as really? really quick. <clears throat> if you got back onto the cage and you're the first one down, after they've been drawing coal and they just forget about it, you might drop <laughs> 300 foot in space of about three seconds. Oh, wow. And your stomach was in your mouth. <laughs> and then just put brakes on and steady it up a bit <laughs> before you start going back, back down. But yeah, that used to make your stomach churn a bit. <laughs> that's that story where it used to annoy the controllers in the top then. They used to put it onto that mode and like literally give them, give them a bit of a shake. Oh, the... They regularly used to do it. I mean, it, a lot of the old miners had, had just turned round and they'd walk, go back out at pit because they could claim... <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to think of the right word. Not compensation, but he's dropped it too quick, I don't feel too good. Oh, really? Want, yeah. And oh, well, his stomach uh, type Yeah, thing. yeah. And just make out that they were ill because he's dropped it too quick. And they, did you, you could tell it did used to drop Really quick, yeah. You, as soon as they take them brakes off, it could be you could maybe drop thirty or forty foot, hundred foot in, in a second, you know. And then you'd probably realise and, and go back to your normal. Your normal speed was still quick because they need to get you down there. Because while ever they're transporting men up and down, they're not making money, yeah. so they need to get you down, get all the miners down there for that five minute slot, ten minute slot, getting everybody down there, and then start drawing coal again. Sure. Uh, and then same at the end of a shift, you could be waiting for them to finish drawing coal before they'd let you back out. You know, it, you know, because it, it, while ever there was no men there, you would... Yeah, we're losing money, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So it just keep drawing coal all the time. Another story, I mean, I, I never ever witnessed... Well, I'm saying I didn't witness it. I, I witnessed the aftermath. Uh, there was a fitter, who I, who I knew... <coughs> He was working on the headgear, and it's it's a, a big drum, probably six foot in diameter, and the steel rope is wrapped round it, round and round and round and down. And his job for that weekend, he was putting new brake shoes on, because they have brake shoes in a car, exactly the same, but they work the opposite way, and they clamp onto the drum, and it... He was having to fit new brake linings this particular weekend. I was working down out down pit at this particular time. But anyway, what he did was he wedged the the brakes off to measure them. And you're probably looking at three foot brake shoes. And as he's wedged them off to start measuring it, there's the cage and the balance weight, which is 20 or 30 tonne it started on the upward and it's it's coming up that quick it threw three or four yards of slack Jeez. he got caught up in this three or four yards of slack as it tightened back up again so there was nothing left of him it he just thousand pieces the cage came up that quick it went through sort of two foot girders, cracked them completely open and ended up right at the top of the winding gear uh, 
and we, we all had to go out round to another shaft to try to get out that day. There were about a thousand miners down there and it was that, that shaft then was out of work for the next six months, eight months while they, they redid it. But yeah, it came up that quick, it, it just threw loads of snap. I mean, ropes that thick. Jeez. And in a split second, it threw the slack out open, and in that split second, it cracked two again, but it had got him at the same time and just tightened up on the drum, and, and that was it. And it shouldn't ever have wedged these brake shoes off. <laughs> so the lift came through the girders and just went to yeah. the, and oh, basically a box, went up onto the wheel. Yep, yep. The, the cage was wedged right up into the top, and the cage must be, just as in a guess, it'd be 15, 20 tonne on its own. Uh, and it, it went through these steel girders and just parted them like balsa wood and it was wedged up in there so when we come out of the pit it was up there, the police was everywhere but it was, this girder was just broke open and it had gone straight way up through it uh, and there was, they found bits of the cage spread over 200 yards over the pit top and bits of oil flown off and everything and it was, like I said, that pit, uh, that shaft was closed for good six or eight months while they repaired it all. Yeah. That doesn't do you uh, confidence in the lift and that operator. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of faith in other people, isn't there? A lot of reliance on other people. Oh, all doing their own job. Yeah. Yeah, all doing their own job. If everybody does the job, it's, it's easy, does it properly? Yeah. yeah. I think what, what was interesting when we were talking is um, everybody else that we've seen Lawrence, has been like a miner in, in a big group of miners. Mm. So, so we're all working in quite in a, a team. Group. Yeah, and you, and you said your role was quite solitary, really. Yeah. So, like, going back to the other bit where you said you were thinking about leaving and, and you didn't really have I didn't have that no. group because. I never worked did, with him. Yeah. You just really wanted it. Yep. Sit down, do yep. that, do that, and you just spent your time. I, I used to have the, the close knit with the other fitters, yeah. but not that I'd only see those at the start of the shift and maybe at the end of the shift when you're doing your reports. Uh, and for duration of the shift, you'd probably be working on your own or with a other person. But that a other person, you're not supposed to work with them the following day, it might be somebody else or whatever, yeah. depending where they sent you. And I could get sent. Anywhere, really. Anywhere. So if he was here, I might be over five mile that way one day and three mile down there next day. So. The scale's amazing, isn't it? Mm. Do you know when you talk about like five miles? That, that is a massive distance. Well, yeah. It's, but I know, I mean, I, I know quite a few of the pits used to be interlinked, so it, they, always, they, they always said that, if, yeah, you'd have a fair walk, but if, if, if that shaft got sealed for whatever reason. You could walk to Armthorpe or wherever to get back I out. Always get, I never understand how they all link up. I mean, that's a yeah. It's uh, you could you could walk to to get out somewhere else. Was that purely for safety reasons, or I think it was because there was that many mines in this area. They they just eventually there was it in each other. Yeah, uh, I mean the at least one seven. And I, I mean, I did it quite a few times. The the escape route, Second Ebris, it used mm. to be, and that used to be a route that they wanted everybody to know and learn yeah. that if anything did happen, there was a way you could walk out. And you, you'd start the shift, and you'd only work for maybe an hour, but then you would take six or eight people with you for this route to get back out of the mine, so that there's always somebody on these shifts who would know the escape route. But that escape route has probably never been used for 10, 15 years, so in places it might only be <laughs> two or three foot high, because it all, it's all cobbled in. Yeah, it's all caved in and everything, but you, you knew you could go out if you carried on walking, and you'd get there eventually. As long as you keep, kept following the tunnels. It, yeah. yeah. So when all the mines were closing down and stuff, where, how were you feeling about all that? I mean, were you acting in any way were you no no uh, I mean I'd left by the time that I mean I remember the, the 72 strike uh, 
uh, and I can remember it very plainly, but the main, the big strike, the year one, year long one, uh, I'd left it then, yeah. and I was in a different industry. And you and weren't kind of involved in any way? No, no. I was with the, in so much as I was in finance then, mm. and it reflected in our f figures, because we'd got a lot of miners who were working, and obviously going no wages with them. So yeah, it, it, example of how the, the, the web of this thing could reach out into... Exactly, yeah. Uh, and obviously if people have got payments for in finance... I mean, I can remember the, the 72 strike. I mean, I'd only just... I'd only had my car, maybe six months. And I remember uh, the finance guy coming to the house, coming to rep repossess my car. And, uh, and I says... I mean, we ended up not having an argument, but I just had a discussion with him. I says, it's there on my paper. He came to see me why I hadn't made any payments. And I says, what's it say where I work on, on your paperwork? And he gets it out and he says, you, you worked out mine? I says, yeah. I says, do you read news? <laughs> and I says, we're on strike. And I mean, because I was a single fella, mm. and only my mother, I didn't have what they called dependent relatives. Mm. So we never got strike pay or anything like that at that time. Oh, it was... Uh, if you was a married man, you did get strike pay. Right. It, was, it weren't a lot, but a single person didn't get anything. You never got anything at all. Uh, so for, I can't remember, it was only a couple of months, I think, that strike. Yeah. Uh, so for that period, there was nothing. And I even said to the finance company, I said, look, I said, if you want to repossess it, it's keys, you can take it. I said, oh, you can bear with me and wait till I get back to work. And I said, I'll pay you. Anyway, they yeah. did. So... I still kept my car. <laughs> so in your finance company work, were you aware of um, miners and their... Fin were they coming to you? I mean, was there lots of finance for people who obviously... Obviously, you oh, were lending time. money. Yeah, yeah, big time, yeah. And everything just got frozen for that 12 months. But at that time, you didn't know you were freezing it for 12 months. Yeah. It was week in, week out, and it just extended to 12 months. So... Uh, it, it, the knock-on effect for that strike was just colossal, really. Mm. Uh, far reaching beyond just the, them families because the knock-on effect of, of it just spread yeah. more and more. Uh, yeah, it was a sad day, really, when, it, uh, when all that sort of kicked off. But I, in one way, I was, I was just glad I was out of it. it yeah. uh, you well, know, it was, yeah. I, I witnessed quite a few of the... the not so much the rioting, the actual uh, confrontations between the miners and the and the police. Uh, witnessed them, and how did you end up witnessing them? Were they the they like? one one particular uh, week. I mean, it, I remember because I was working in this finance company. I can remember uh, in Selby, which is only it's twenty mile away, and I remember seeing all these police vans rolling up. And they were all going through town, and they'd all got the, the screens on, with big wire mesh screens. Yeah. And there must have been about 30 of these vans. So I shot out at office and just, because they was all pulling up. And there must have been about 15 to 20 police in each one of these vans. And they all gets out with the riot gigs. They'd been tipped off that, because there was a, uh, a power station not far away, and all the miners was coming, and they basically just... Uh, a deadlock because all the miners was there and all the police was there with the shields on just shouting and bawling at each other and you're just witnessing it and you th it was just like something out of a <laughs> another world yeah. Uh, but yeah it was uh, that was eye opener yeah suddenly on your quiet sleepy town whatever there's Almost well, a very strange kind of you know, confrontation, I suppose. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a part of it, you know, it's like yeah. every day, a surreal moment. Yeah. <laughs> every day, yeah. like up outside the happy shopper, yeah. there is guys oh, with yeah. white shields and guys with yeah. presumably. It was just, yeah, it was, it was strange because, it, it, I mean, Selby is just a really, really little quiet town, ever so quiet, and all of a sudden seeing these 150 stormtrooper type police yeah. all with riot gear on the mast the shields and the belt in the shields with the truncheons and it's just a racket and the miners are there uh, I mean nothing came to nothing that particular day but obviously there was uh, 
you've, you've seen it on the news at different other places where there yeah. was plenty of fighting. A friend of mine, I mean, he worked uh, Kellen Lippitt, and but he was a really good runner. <laughs> and I mean, I, I've told this story, but it, it, the way he told it was was fantastic. Uh, and it was this particular day, and it, I think it was, uh, it weren't Orgreave, it was somewhere similar to Orgreave, where there was probably two or three, four hundred miners, and about a thousand police, uh, and it was really hot summer's day, and there'd been all this confrontation, and this friend of mine, uh, he kept winding the police up to chase him, and they kept chasing him, but it was a marathon runner and it, it took him across about six or eight fields and every time he was going away from him he'd stop and walk and he said I used to fall onto the floor as if I was tired that would make the police who'd got all this riot gear on thinking he's nearly there let's go after him again and they'd chase him again and that would jump up and start running again and he said he got, he got about six or eight of these police about two mile away and then he just took two or three lanes away and went back to his car no. <laughs> and these police had been chasing him and uh, they'd have never caught him but the way he was telling it he'd wait till there was about 20 yards away from him then jump up and just start running again <laughs> and they were never ever going to catch him well he was resting anyway wasn't oh, he? It, uh, it was hilarious yeah. Uh, it's some sort of cartoon, isn't it? Yeah, oh yeah. And he actually, I mean, they, they caught him. They, they didn't do anything with him. But another time, uh, he wanted an helmet. And he, he picked this police helmet up and he'd got it and he stuffed it under, under his jumper. And obviously there's all, there's everything that's going off. We've got this minor, uh, this police helmet up his shirt. Uh, and just before he was trying to go, go away, this hand gets on his shoulder and pulls him back and turfs him into the back of a police van. Anyway, they, they didn't do anything other than give his helmet back because they'd seen him with this helmet and he wanted it for his mantelpiece. But, uh, he don't work out mines anymore either. Uh, do you still you don't keep in touch with any of those guys at all? <clears throat> I see him. I mean, I never ever worked with him. Uh, he worked in the... At that time, I didn't even know him, to be fair. Uh, but we run together. So oh, right, I, right. I see him, but he's been left before me, to be, uh, just after me. But he's into uh, dog breeding and oh, right. sheepdog trials now. <laughs> That's what he does now, yeah. Completely change of... Did you run when you were at the pit then? No, you no. It, I go into it, really, from my brother. Uh, my brother lives... All my family live in Canada. Oh, right. uh, was left really now and the my brother had started running and he'd done quite a few marathons over in Canada and America and he'd said to me uh, he was coming over to do the 1988 London Marathon so anyway he came over he did it uh, and at that time I weren't running and I just said to him as a joke I says well we'll both enter next year and we'll do it together just as a two brothers doing marathon uh, at London and anyway, uh, so he entered over in Canada, and I entered in England, I got in, and he didn't. <laughs> and I, I even said to him, I said, look, I, says, I don't want to do it. I says, here's my number, come over and do it. He says, no, he says, you do it. He says, and he says, at one time, we'll, we will get to do it together. So I ended up doing L London, uh, and I, I just did it on my own. And we never ever did get round to doing London all, together. Really? But, I mean, I did it uh, nine times. Good. But uh, we never ever ran together. I've done a couple of hearths together, uh, but he, he doesn't run at all now. He's uh, the older. Yeah, yeah. But he's had a hip replacement as well. So this is your brother. So you were living. He's an older brother. Your mum and obviously your sister. Mm -hmm. You were left, and your older brother had left. Yeah, me, my brother emigrated when I was sixteen. Jeez. Uh, he'd gone. He went to. He just stopped, and the family he got married into. All their family was slowly moving, emigrating to Canada. <coughs> so I remember him saying, we're going to live in Canada. And it never, ever really, it didn't, at 16, it didn't hit home to you that you might not see him again. <laughs> uh, and they just emigrated with two tea chests and uh, a baby in their arms. <laughs> really? And that was it. I was 16, uh, he was 21. And that was it. He upped and went. And I, I didn't see him again for 16 years. 
Blimey. Uh, almost by accident. Well, we, once I've got enough money, I managed to, to trace him in Canada because we lost touch completely. What? Uh, totally lost touch. How come? I mean, he knew where you were, surely. He's never been one for writing. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's never been there. I mean, since then we do keep it. I mean, now you can FaceTime each other. But at that time it just weren't. And he, he moved quite a few different places, different houses and different areas. And we just, we lost touch, everything. Uh, I mean, I was a 16-year-old lad, so yeah. at, at that time it never really, it didn't hit home to me that day that, I remember the day really plainly now, he'd got baby in his arms and my mates were wanting me to go out on motorbike, so I just jumped on bike, said, see ya, and that was it, I rode away. Oh. Uh, and I never saw him again, like, wow. 15 odd years. Uh, so but how did you find him? It was a friend of my grandma at that time, she'd gone to, she'd got friends who lived in a town very near to where my brother used to live, and while she were there, she made some inquiries about the, because it's an unusual name, our name, uh, it's French, it's Duros. Duros. How do you spell that? D U R O S E. Duros? Yeah. Duros. It used to be hyphenated, it used to be D U with an hyphen. So it's French. But anyway, so it's an unusual name. And she made some inquiries and she managed to get a potential address and phone number where my brother could live. And this particular night I was with my sister and we decided, because we, uh, we decided we'll try and phone this number. Really? And we gave it a ring, and it was my brother. So we spoke to him, uh, and we hadn't spoke then for at least 14 years. And, and at that time, it was costing you a pound a minute or something stupid yeah. like that, costing you a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to him, uh, I said, I'm thinking of coming over. He says, uh, is that okay? And he says, get yourself over. So I... I booked a flight that year and went over, and he met me at airport. Wow. Uh, and so we've kept in touch a lot better since. Yeah. Uh, I'm going over in uh, three months' time. Was that quite emotional? Or was it kind of just sort of, oh, yeah? <laughs> at, at that time it was. Uh, now it's, because yeah, I can see him every day, so to speak, if I yeah. want, uh, it's not as bad. But for first, for, from that time on, I went over every year to see him. Uh, him and his family and every time I come to come home it was emotional mm. it was uh, and I, I think he's been back maybe twice since then maybe three times when my mother died he came over for the funeral really so uh, really doesn't he really did go oh yeah he's uh, I think he's only been back three times since 1969 jeez oh yeah he's, he's Canadian yeah. <laughs> and all his I mean I, I see his his son I mean, we go on skiing holidays together, me and him. So I see his son ten times more than I see my really? brother. Because uh, my nephew, I mean, he's 40... Well, he was one when they emigrated. Right, yeah. Uh, so we, we go skiing every year. Uh, and so I do see him a lot more than... You're a pretty physical guy. Well, he's, he's trying to rope me into a... <laughs> I mean, I still haven't decided whether... He wants me to go on a, a biking holiday in September, October time. And it's from Cambodia to Vietnam, or Vietnam to Cambodia. And it's a two-week cycle, and it's between 60 and 100 kilometres a day over 13 days. <coughs> and you're seeing all the sights of yeah. Thailand and Cambodia. But I just don't know whether... I suffer a lot with me, me collarbone. Or I busted, it, yeah. mm, I busted it a couple of times, and I, I don't know whether cycling on hundred k a day is going <laughs> to affect me, <laughs> me shoulder too much. Yeah. So I, I still haven't decided because I'll decide once I once I've been to Canada and seen him and we've had a chat. Yeah. I don't know. So, but it's, it's, yeah, I, I try to keep myself active because I think you've got to do. Yeah, yeah. I think you've got to do because. <clears throat> Too many people just sit back and stagnate, don't they? So yeah, yeah. I think while ever you, you can keep active, uh, I try to. And so your brother had no, but he, obviously he didn't. What was his preferred? Did he, he he left? Did he he didn't. Leave, he'd, 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 he'd be the first one to say he got no qualifications, no 
uh, nothing going for him in this country, full stop. Mm. Uh, and the family, he, his wife, who he married, her parents was into pig farming, only on a short, small scale, but they very much like pig farming. And his wife had got eight brothers and sisters, so it was a big family, there were nine of them. And over a period of a few years before he got married and after they got married, two or three of them had gone to live in Canada, had come back. His wife's grandparents both lived in Canada. It was English, but they'd, they, they'd emigrated full stop. Uh, and it just got the... There was more and more of her family moving over yeah. there, so he decided to go with them. And he emigrated... And it, I think when he went, I'm sure it was a day's, a day's journey to get there. Yeah. Uh, it was like two or three stopovers to get there. I mean, now it's a seven-hour flight. Yeah. But uh, then it was on an old turbo-prop type aeroplane. <laughs> and yeah. they had two tea chests and a baby, and that was it. He just upped and went, and, and that was it. So he, went, he ended up as a... For 40 years, well, 30-odd years... Uh, Slaughtering chicken. Wow. So he was in charge, he was the quality control manager for a firm which Kentucky fried chicken. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. They'd, they'd, they'd be killing somewhere in regions probably 150,000 a day. But he used to go around all the farms around Canada and America looking at the quality of these yeah, farms, yeah. of the quality of the chicken, to see if it was good enough for. And it's then busy. he would sign them up for, well, I want a thousand a day off you or whatever. And that was his job. He was college control manager. Was he the sort of guy you looked up to when you were a kid? Well, because when your father died again, he developed. My, my father died, yeah. Uh, well, we, we never, we, from my mum and dad divorcing when I was nine, me and my sister went to live with my mother. And my brother went to live with my dad. So, from oh, me being really? nine year old... How did that work? I mean, <laughs> that's pretty hardcore. He, well, he was... He's six years older than me. Right. So, he started work. He so, he 15, could... 15. Yeah. He went down mining. Did he? He went down mining. <laughs> we only did it for <laughs> three months. He, he, he couldn't... He didn't like it. He didn't... You know, uh, so... But he'd got that choice, of so-called adult... Yeah. He wanted to go with my dad, and uh, and so he he moved in with my dad at the house that we used to live at, Gosh. and me, my sister, and my mother moved out. And, I mean, so we you, moved. your mother moved out of mm. the family home. Yeah, we went to live down Devon. We down moved. Devon. Yeah. Oh <laughs> she she got an, a sister, an auntie, down there, uh, and she wanted a clean break from Nottinghamshire, so we we just up and went within a few weeks and. Moved down Devon. <laughs> Didn't stop down there long, but it was. Did you a, like it down there? I did, yeah. Yeah, but I couldn't remember a right lot about it. I was only sort right. of nine, ten year old, so I didn't re remember a right lot yeah. about it. Uh, it was a lot of. For the next sort of two or three years, we, was, we moved around a lot. Just me, my mum, and my sister in different houses and what have you. Uh, it was. Yeah, you know, it was a bit hard. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, my brother, he'd, he'd left the mines, he'd gone steel erecting, and he was all over the country working. Oh. Uh, and so once I'd got to be like, I'd say 14, 15, he used to come home odd weekends and we'd see each other, but we never really... We got closer when I went back to Canada mm. <laughs> than we were as two brothers, because we, we never ever had that brother... Relations. We weren't together. My, yeah, my brother lives in Australia, and so I don't obviously see him. Yeah. But your brother. Yeah. Yeah. But when we when I when I do go out there, it is quite it's quite because I have a show. I'm lucky my, my my exhibitions go out there now, so I, I'm lucky to go out there and yeah. do work. So I go and see them, and actually, they're quite powerful um, weeks. Yeah. Because all that time is gone. He's, yeah. He's been away 16, 17 years. Yeah. And as you 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 kind of go back to the point you when do. you left. Yeah. You and do. you kind of go over it. Yeah. And you get, because you have an impression of why they did it. Yeah. And they've got an impression of what it felt. And you kind of recalibrate and work it all out. And yeah. you spend a lot of time. Oh, yeah. Walking yeah. along beaches, 
going, did you do this? Did I feel that? And I didn't do that. I, no, give me a break. I, I let you borrow that record in 1962. <laughs> yeah. okay, and it's, you... um, I never forgave you for that. You know, yeah. you didn't realise what you'd done and all this sort of stuff. And it's gone, really? <laughs> and there'll be my brother. I mean, the first year when I went over, I mean, I, I really enjoyed it and he enjoyed it, having me brother over there. And he introduced me to one of his close friends uh, and... Uh, and he was talking to me this particular day, and he, he said, he says, for years, he says, I didn't even know Ben had got a brother. That's my brother's name. Uh, mm. He says, I didn't even know he'd got a brother in England. And he says, and when I queried it about him, he says, well, he says, to be honest, he says, I don't think he'll be alive now. Because I, I used to be a bit of a nutcase on motorbikes. <laughs> and I'd, by the time my brother went, I'd, I'd broke 18 bones. What? I'd, I'd broke both my legs twice, shoulder, collarbone, ribs. Is this when you were racing bikes? Or just I used to race them, but this was on the road. Really? Mm. Yeah. I'd, Let's yeah. just go there a bit. What, so Between 16 and 18, between 16 years old and 18 years old, I broke 18 bones. Your mum must have been a nervous wreck, let yeah. alone you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I used to be was a bit that, of a nutcase. What, what, so, <laughs> I don't want to go psycho on you, but do you think you were working stuff through? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I just like speed. I used to like, I'm slowed up now. I mean, I still got a bike yeah. and I still go out on it, but uh, I've, uh, I've steadied up now. <laughs> but I, 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 I think that's why I suffer so much with my shoulder. Yeah. I, I broke this one, I think it's three times now, this the collarbone. Uh, so yeah, he it, 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 it just didn't think I'd survive because he was yeah. there for a short period of time. 12 when, bones, dozen, yeah, dozen crashes. When I was in hospital, yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so you were a long-haired... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> biker? Yeah, yeah, in the 60s. What do they call you around here? What were they... Were you a Rockers. Part, you were part of a tribe? Yeah, the... So what, what it, was the music you were into? Uh, Had to be a... It was all 60s... Not so much heavy rock, because they didn't really have heavy rock then, no. but maybe just 60s music. Uh, I mean, it was the mods and rocker era, mm. to be fair. And mods was all into the, a different type of music. But, yeah, yeah probably 60s music, which I'm, I still love 60s music. Yeah. But that's never really changed. Uh, so did, were you a part of a tribe then, or were you a part of a gang? Uh, I, I wouldn't call it a gang. We used to meet up, all the bikers. It'd be probably 20 to 30 of us would all have bikes uh, in Retford, and we'd all meet up in the Market Square. And we'd all just sit and sit on bikes chatting, and then at probably eight o'clock every night we'd go up to the. There used to be a big bikers cafe at Blythe, up on the A1, yeah. and we'd all head up there at, uh, in a convoy, race each other up there. I mean, you must have been scaring the life out of the natives. Yeah, yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> uh, we'd end up there, but at, at this cafe on the A1, there'd be bikers there from all over Nottinghamshire. At, so there could be that any particular time there could be a couple of hundred there bikes at this and you'd stop there to, for as long as you want with the view then you'd get back and race back home and that was it and, and um, that, it used to be most nights that really mm. and there was obviously lots of people getting hurt and doing mischief to themselves when they were I lost a few friends when I was 16, 17 on, really? you know getting killed and that, on bikes uh, yeah but you don't Think about it. Yeah, yeah. It's part of. You'd say you wouldn't get back on a bike again, would you? It, uh, if I mean, I never ever wanted because I've got. You, in fact, you met this one, I think. Yeah. Uh, I never ever wanted him to get a bike ever, because I know what I'd gone through. But, but yeah. I don't know. It, it, it just did. I mean, he ended up with a. What was it ten times quicker machine than well, I ever thousand had? Thousand cc. Oh, monster. It was a monster. Uh, but luckily, he never ever got into a. To going out with a group of yeah he only ever went out me and him so i was on my bike he was on his bike you did a responsible dad yeah full leathers and with yeah. voluminous jackets well no i don't have <laughs> well, but we were still regular every every weekend if it was nice weather we would go out uh with a pat lunch for a ride and <laughs> drop off at the cafe yeah. uh, but wherever we went, once we'd got to wherever we were going, we'd then swap bikes. Oh, and right. I'd, I'd bring his back and he'd bring mine back. Uh, and that's what we used to do. But he sold it last year. 
uh, and I was glad he did. Mm. And he, he actually said, he says, I'm going to get rid of it. He says, because he says, I've got away with it. Yeah. And he says, without ever coming off. And he says, I've, and he's kept all his leathers and everything. And I, in the fullness of time, he'll probably end up. I mean, we go to TT regular, me and him. Really? What, on the Isle of Man? Yeah. Really? Uh, you never do it? No. I've ridden around it, but I'm, I've never raced it. Oh, that's, that's something else that that's. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, you need you need some nerves for that one. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, my nerves won't be big enough for that. Uh, so yeah, we spend a lot of time together, but isn't it? It's never. We're still into bikes, pair of us, yeah. and we still go to race meetings and watch the and spectate and things like that. Uh, but luckily, he's got past the stage. He's quite happy in a car yeah. now. And have you? So, uh, How many children? We got one son or. A boy and a girl, oh. and it was my daughter basically who told me about you. Oh really? And she lives in Belgium. No. She's she's lived there now what? for the last four years, in Belgium. I mean she comes over regular. Yeah. I mean I speak to her regular, and it was. She'd just gone back home. She'd come home for Christmas. Between Christmas and New Year, and she FaceTime me. And she says. I've seen something on Facebook. She says, uh, I'll send you a link and have a read of it. So between Christmas and New Year, she, and she just sent me this link off Facebook. I've still got the link, but I can't remember what it said, but it was basically Danny's name yeah. uh, trying to find people from, who worked in the mines in mm. Doncaster and what have you. And I mean, she knew I worked out Pitt and what have you. So from her sending me this message in Belgium... <laughs> wow! I then emailed Danny that that day, yeah. and just said, you know, my daughter sent me this link. Uh, I don't know if you're still in wanting people, and what have you. And I got an automated reply from him saying that it was on holiday till eighth of January. And I, from that, I forgot all about it. And yeah. I thought, well, yeah, it just die of death. And then about the ninth or tenth of January, I just got this email from Danny saying. Yeah, and that's how it progressed. But Brilliant. like I said, my daughter in Belgium, she Good got to know about it. That's amazing. It is, and it just shows you how, how far yeah. things could or have yeah. spread and what have you. Uh, she got to know it way before I did. And I mean, she even she FaceTimed me last night and uh, wanted to know how it was going and what have you. So I told her I was here got, today. She can watch us now. Yeah. She's probably watching yeah. it now. Yeah. Because uh, this will be on now forever, I think. Is it? What, the, the film? Will it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now uh, you're part of the box set. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's um, basically they're doing, this is being recorded as well as going out now. Going so out in some internet. It's on the internet. It's on YouTube. We're, is we're it? on YouTube now. Right. Yeah. So will it stop on YouTube, this? It'll stay on right. YouTube. Yeah, there's a link. Right. You'll get a link. Right. We should do this. There's a link. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, basically, yeah, this, your testimony. Yeah will be a part of a 12-part box set, yeah. let's call it that. Oh, right. And um, so... We've and is that part this, of your... This is part of the consultation, yeah. really. It's part right. of... Basically, basically, it's just trying to make... Get out, outreach. I mean, it's just, it's just... This project is all about people like you telling their stories and telling the world their stories yeah. and yeah. getting it out there because it hasn't been recorded. And... Um, I said, I think I want to do portraits of people. That's incredible. You have to talk to me, basically. Yeah, yeah. I can't concentrate unless yeah. you know, yeah. I've got to think about this yeah. and work while you're talking. And there's nothing better than someone having to tell their story. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, we've had, you know, you're one of the sort of incredible testimonies that we've had. Mm -hmm. And um, it will be there forever. Right. All right. Well, as long as ever, yeah. you know, as long yeah. as there's electricity in the world. Right. Yeah. And a cathode ray tube, I suppose. Oh, I'll have to send her the link. She'll yeah. Be, she'll be over the moon with that because... Yeah. Uh, with her finding it, like I say... Yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, and it was oh, just out of blue when she sent me this message. And when I read it, I thought, well, I'll email him. Because she says, are you going to do it? And she was pushing me, basically. Really? Uh, and I thought, well, yeah. And then it just progressed from there. Well, they've ended up being these... I mean, we watched them last night, and they've ended up being these really quite interesting programmes because you're kind of watching your likeness evolve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as someone's telling a story, so you've got this kind of double, double interest, and it's become very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. 
far more interesting than I expected. Yeah. I was thinking the other day that we I could have easily sat in a pub with someone like Danny or John who runs this. And we could have said that was brilliant that project. We had all those wonderful conversations. If only we Lin well recorded them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. it's happening. Yeah. And um I mean technology now is so much better than it was. Mm. I mean, I look back to my, my biking times when I yeah. used to be on the bike and and different jobs that I'd done, and but never had anything's ever recorded. And no. I, could, I got those three pictures when I was down the mines, but uh, and I've got two or three reasonably good pictures of me when I was on a bike mm. when I was 15 and 16. But nowadays, I've got. I mean, I must have took a thousand pictures of my bike that I've got now, and yeah, they're all yeah. recorded, no. but uh, not not ones of the ones. Because the, the number of times my son said, oh, "I wish you'd got pictures of this," or "I wish I'd got pictures of that," mm. and I never ever kept, ever ever got them because there weren't the technology yeah. around to do it. Really, that is amazing. This needs to be used well, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> That's it. I need you. You need to stop talking a minute and do your bloom and mouth. Yeah. I haven't been able to get your bottom lip at all. It actually goes straight out there. Now you know you're being recorded. You go on quiet, yeah? Clam <laughs> <laughs> up. Yeah. What does your daughter do in Belgium? Well, that's it. She's gone, like me, just completely different change of uh, career. What's her name? She, Laura. Yeah. Uh, now, in Belgium, they don't, they don't take the husband's name. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she's still known as Laura Duros in, in Belgium uh, but her name is Toolin T-O-E-L-E-N that's like a piece of con- that's an yeah. ingredient in wax yeah, in Belgium. I mean she, she met him on she'd come out of a relationship uh, and went on holiday with her cousin and they met these couple of guys in I think it's off the coast of Africa somewhere uh, years and years ago and she said she was an enjoying holiday, this, that and the other. Came back from the holiday, kept in touch with this lad in Belgium. Uh, a few weeks later, she flew over to Belgium to see him. Yeah. A few weeks later, he flew over here. Uh, and then it progressed. So every weekend, Friday night, she'd leave work early, drive through to Manchester Airport, and she'd go for a weekend, and she did that virtually every weekend for year 18 months she'd be over in Belgium and okay. uh, and occasionally he'd be over here as well you know so they used to do it in turns but there weren't a weekend virtually hardly any weekend that they didn't see each other mm. uh, so you're thinking well does long distance relationships work and yeah they do uh, mm. and then but she worked in a bank uh, in a building site in a bank and and she'd progressed away through that but uh, and I'm saying it was a career, but she did, I'm not saying she enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, and then she was on a two-week holiday in Belgium yeah. uh, from a job in Goul. And then the, she phoned me up to say, Dad, I've got a job. I said, yeah, I, said, I know you've got a job. She says, no, I've got a job in Belgium. I said, oh, right. And she could tell I'd gone quiet. Yeah. Uh, and she was telling me about it. And she says... Uh, she says, I'm going to take it. I says, right. So for the next few weeks, uh, she's packing things up in her bedroom. And, oh, God. How uh, old is she? She's 30. Now. Well, how old was, was she then? 20... Oh, God. 25. So 24. She's, she's 24. stayed with you for... Yeah. She stayed with you for a while. Mm, yeah. And... Uh, this particular weekend when he, a partner, at that time they, were, they weren't married, mm. he drove over from Belgium, uh, loaded the car up and that was it. I was in pieces yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as she drove off and that was it. Uh, Is your wife still around? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, she's working. She's at work today. Uh, and she got married, I think it was about a year later. Got married and we all went over. Wow. Our family went over there for for wedding. Whereabouts in Belgium is it? It's it's a really little, small village called uh, Alst, but it's uh, not far from Brussels. That's the easiest. Mm. Uh, 
play. When, whenever you see these, uh, I'm just trying to think of the name of it. When where all the terriers have been hanging out at oh, yeah, Mott, yeah, yeah, Mott, yeah, yeah. Mott, Mott, Mott Beck or something. Yeah, yeah. Which is near there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's only a little, right, little village, which is, like I say, a completely different change of career. This particular family in who a partner knew was wanting a nanny, for want of a better mm. word, an English nanny. Mm. Uh, the children are sort of three year, two at this time, two year, three year old, up yeah. to, I don't know, five, six. Uh, so my daughter's job at that time was she'd go there in an afternoon, take their vehicle, go round the three schools to pick the children up, take them home, give them the tea, and wait for the parents to come home, and then she'd come home. Mm. And she's done that ever since. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's, she bring, she's basically, I'm saying teaching them English. They're picking up a lot of English yeah. through her, and she's done it ever since, the same family. So she's gone from being in a bank to being a wow. type of a nanny. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think the nanny is the correct term, yeah. but she gets the tea ready, looks after him until uh, the parents go, come home at six, seven o'clock at night, and she jumps in the car and comes back home. Mm. And then occasionally it might be a weekend, she'll go and help out at weekends or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's what she does. Gosh. Completely different career. Yeah. About ten minutes ago, there you are. All right. And I'm Steve. Jeez. Paul and you, Steve, will send you the link as well so you can send it to your daughter. Yeah, if, uh, that'd be great. I was just telling Lawrence, yeah, it'd be fantastic that. So, what happens with that now? Right, okay. I, um, well, I want to addition them. So, that means we can make lots of you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, which also means we make a mould, yeah. so make a rubber mould. So I should have brought one actually. Um, so my assistant. Paul will be over that. Yeah, yeah. My, I've got a print, load of apprentices at the moment, and these are perfect projects to learn. They're simple moulds to make. Right. So I've got a guy, two guys that are learning, basically learning mould making. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting. You kind of almost plan their apprenticeships because you know these jobs are coming. So, Louis and Eva will be making your... She's an Italian. She's come from Florence to work. Right. And Louis has just finished at Hereford doing a degree. So he's training. Um, they, they're, they're artists, basically. Okay. Now they? Uh, Ever will be uh, mid to late 20s and Louis will be early 20s. Right. And so they basically signed up. But now we have to contract them all now. It's all PAYE and stuff. Right. It's ridiculous. I'm just a pathetic sculptor. You, know, you yeah. end up having to do all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So they work for you. Yeah. So there's uh, about six at the moment who work. I've got some great. You may have seen in the photographs in the talk. Yeah. I've got some great, um, incredible craftsmen. Yeah. That, um, and did they just apply to you, or did you recruit? You kind of know them. Right. You, in the business, you know them. Yeah. And you, you, you kind of go. Coach them. When you're ready. Yeah. Or. Yeah. Some of them. Say Lawrence, when you know what you're doing, of course that's amazing. I'll, I'll join. You know, yeah. Is there any chance of? Mm -hmm. yeah, you just caught them. It was much yeah. like a, you know, you, you build your team, don't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But there are a couple of well, actually, to be honest, if I say a couple, all of them are essential, and um, they've all been kind of trained, or they've trained me. Um, it's, it's just extraordinary. It takes two or three years to learn the process properly, and so. They have to be with you and work with you for at least three years before mm -hmm. they become useful, really. Right. And uh, so there's now six or seven, and um, four of them, five of them are... Look, big premises, you think? Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. It's turned into a very big yeah. thing. And uh, so two of them, basically what I said about ten years ago to my first couple of assistants, said, well, I'm going to teach you, and you're going to teach him. Yeah. And I'm not going to teach anyone ever again. Because I was yeah. just teaching, 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 teaching. Just wears you down. And you end up, well, not that, but you never get anything done. You, yeah. just go, well, get, you finish someone, you think, you're a brilliant caster. And then um, they go. Yeah. And then, you know, then the next... So, so always you make sure. them everything? I was at that time, yeah. Yeah. in the sense of bronze casting. Yeah. And yeah. they come because they want to learn sculpture as well. Yeah. And um, so I end up having to jump into, say, okay, I'm going to take two on. 
quick, even though I might think I need them. So one trains the other, so I'm never left exposed. Right. Yeah. Before you know it, then you think, oh, two people have created that job, oh God, I now need three. And then you think, oh, I can't yeah. possibly need four. Yeah. But that you know, it went on and like that, and now it's got to this point. So how did you recruit the people from abroad? Well, they're fine. I teach, they do a, do a taste teaching in London. Like I do a workshop in London and I go to a college and teach for a week. Mm -hmm. And you just notice a couple of students, they're about yeah. to leave next year. And then they might email you. And they kind of email you in an interesting way. And they'll say, can I come and visit your studio? You go, yeah. yeah. I said, By the way, I've read this article. I've yeah. I thought of you, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Think, well, okay, that's interesting. You're, you're yeah. thinking out of the box. Yeah. Yeah, you can come over. And then before you know it, they go, you know, you should, actually, you're more interested than you should be. Yeah. You're not just the average Joe. Mm -hmm. And um, you say, well, why don't you, you know, sort of starts to be an fulfilling, uh, sort of fulfilling its own kind of prophecy, really. Right. Anyway, so they'll be making rubber moulds mm -hmm. of these. So we have, a rubber mold, we'll have six rubber moulds done. It'll take them about four or five days to make each mould. Right. And then we make waxes again. So there'll be little Hot wax. Thunder mold. Yeah. So this wax can be, can be cast into bronze. Yeah. But I don't have to. So a wax will be made. So you'll be in green, you'll be green and okay. hollow. And then you'll go in at a refractory mould, which is, can be fired. So we invest you, cover you up. Mm -hmm. And then you go in a kiln. Okay. And you, yes, this goes in a kiln. Yeah. It's wax, or the wax we make, whatever. Yeah. It can be, just if you want to be. Um, and it melts away. And it's a great oh. leap of faith, because you've suddenly got nothing. <laughs> You've got very so delicate mould. No, no. Well, you've got the mould, you've got the rubber mould. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's an extraordinary moment because there's nothing there. Yeah. But there done. will be something very, very permanent not far down the road, you know. Yeah. So you've got a positive sculpture, negative rubber mould. And you've yeah. got positive yeah. wax, and then you have a mould around that, and then you have a negative mould again. So it's positive, yeah. negative, positive, negative. We're in a negative space yeah. with him. So you'll be like, if you open up the mould, you see you a little mask of you in reverse. Uh -huh. yeah. And then we heat up the bronze in the furnace and pour it down the funnel. And there's a piece of be, bar, be runners probably in the bottom of your neck. So it's tubes going through. Yeah, tubes. Yeah. And a cup here. And you pour into the cup and you feed you up. And there'll be risers coming off your nose, yeah. which take the air out. So it flushes in and then the bronze goes up and comes out the risers. And it all fills so up to the top of the fill. cup. Yeah. Yeah. So then you, you smash that mould and then you come out. In bronze. Right. It's like, bloody hell, it works. Magic. It's ma right. it is magic. Yeah. It is amazing. I've seen it actually done. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. It's, you, even after 30 years, you yeah, just it's can't. It's like Christmas time. Yeah. It's just, what is yeah. going, you know. Did that, how did that pick up so my how fingerprints? Does, it, how do you, does the bronze come in blocks? Yeah, ingots. Yeah. 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 Right. We have to melt down. We now have, you showed you in that talk, we have a yeah. uh, half a ton crucible. So we can melt, we can, pass, we can cast life-size figures. Right. And very big things. Mm -hmm. So these are very small. It's amazing. We can have a mould bigger than the size of that door yeah. and a mould the size of your head in the same kiln. They go for 500 degrees for a week and they both cook at the same. It's like, yeah. they, that this would be because okay. Of the, because of the You'd think that this would disintegrate and that yeah. one would be... But because actually, you've got it. Yeah, because it's so slow and gentle. Yeah. They both just ease on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and then we pour in bronze. And then all those... You have little cracks on them from the mould where the pressure of the bronze has hit the mould and opened it a bit, and so these little cracks are called feathers. Right. And every now and again, it depends how you've, what you call first coat, if you just put the first mould coat on, you might have little bubbles on it and things that you've got to pick off, yeah. little inclusions and all this sort of stuff. And then you've got the, the runners and the risers to get rid of, so you've got to get an angle grinder on them, you cut them, you have your, your angle grinders where you start to smooth things down, then you have files, fettles, and all this sort of stuff, and you have to work and work and work on this head to bring it all the juices out, really, all the right. beauty of it. So and all the mark making. It. Yeah. Well, not, not necessarily, they wouldn't polish it. Yeah. It would be um, patinaed into a colour. Yeah. And then, so this could be black, right. or it could be grey, it could be green, it could oh, be brown. Right. Yeah. You have chemicals you apply to the bronze. Yeah. Um, and then you mount it and present it. Right. And hopefully you'll be getting a plaster out of that mould. We can do plasters. Right. The rubber moulds yeah. allow you to. Um, to do a plaster. Yeah, to do a plaster. So hopefully we're going to give everyone a plaster version of right. their head. So that would be like the old... I can remember when I was at, at school, you could buy a... you get for Christmas a plaster... plaster, plaster of Paris mould. That's right, yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, you yeah, just yeah. mix it up and yeah. pour your plaster yeah, in. Little, yeah, a little rabbit or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Well, this is right. dent, dental plaster, so it's really hard. Right. 
hard wearing. Yeah. It's called Hercule. Mm -hmm. um, so it'd be really, really hard plaster, so it's not a danger of... Um, well, it will break if you dropped it from a, yeah, yeah. a lorry yeah. when yeah. you smashed it in a rover. Really. So that would be pretty heavy, that, even that size and in, you in feel that, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. You'll be, you'll be surprised. Yeah. You'll be surprised. Thinking, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the bizarre thing is, solid bronze is not what you want. <coughs> on Antiques Roadshow, when you go, that solid bronze is very good, you think, actually, it's not. Right. It's a, it's a cast. Why isn't it very good? Because a good bronze caster, a good caster, the thinner your wax, the better the quality of the surface. Right. Because there's less shrinkage. So if you think about it, you, you throw a hot metal into something and it will contract as it cools. Yeah. But it's pulling away from surfaces. So yeah. if this was solid and I poured it, it would be spongy because the bronze would shrink and a bit, loads of pitting all over it because it's pulled away from the surface and contracted. Mm -hmm. yeah. The thinner it is, the less contraction, the better the detail. So if this was a four mil thick wax, because when you have the rubber mould, you pour the wax in, yeah. you swill it around and you pour it out quite quickly and you get skin. Right. Yeah. And you open it up and you have a very... Th a head, a wax head, which is completely hollow. And that hollowness, that thickness, is the eventual thickness of the bronze. Ah, right. So the thinner that is, the better the, the, better the quality of casting. Yeah. Uh -huh. The surface. So good bronze casters who care about their craft, as it were, will pride themselves on their thin bronzes. Because yeah. it also shows a great skill in economy and saving right. uh, the costs, you know. Yeah. And can you regulate that yourself on how thick it's going yeah, to be? Yeah, by yeah. the speed, by your, by your deftness of yeah. touch. I mean, yeah. I've got brilliant... You know, I have people that work at the studio now who are just entirely doing the mould making and the Absolutely. wax making. Yeah. They are just the wax guys. Yeah. And they are now swilling these waxes and getting them out and they know exactly... I'm going, hang on, I mean, that, you can't take it out yet. Yeah. You know, it takes a lot of guts yeah. to do a whole day's painting of a wax and a life-size figure, getting it all right and all the high points and everything and getting it all back together and again. You get it under the crane... You get vats and vats of wax all around you and everyone's lifting and pouring them in and pouring them in and it, it frightens the life out of me. I'm watching all this money for a start, you know, going, 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 going. And then they lift it up and then they go, I go, don't pour it out yet. You, 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 yeah. they, they go, woof, the go wax is flying out all over the yeah. shop. My goodness, this is far wasted. too quick. Is it wasted then? No, no, it's on the floor, it's scooped, yeah. we, we splash the floor with water yeah. so it doesn't stick. Yeah. And you sweep it all up and get it back in the bucket. So there's about five people doing it. <laughs> and they go, you can't get it out this don't. Uh, this yeah. We're going to fail. You know, and you go, no, no, we'll be all right. I go, no, we won't, we won't, we won't. And, uh, and then the next day they open up the wax and they get this incredibly thin pair of legs going up to a waist. Yeah. Jeez, that's never going to pour. The bronze yeah. will never travel that far. You know, that's extraordinarily yeah. thin. And Craig goes, oh, that'll yeah. be all right. There you go. So you've got good guys <laughs> so, in. I'm paying for this, that, the all the way down. I go, just can make it a bit thicker that we can yeah. guarantee it's going to be all right. You yeah. know? No, 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 it'll be all right. And go, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so yeah. you trust them. Yeah. So that's the knowledge they understand now. Even in my little foundry, the guys know how to pour the metal, how, what temperatures they get the metal, and how far metal will pour. Tom is an extraordinary uh, metallurgist. He's an extraordinary engineer and brain. Clever. Right? So he'll do temperature gauges and it's 1120 and they go, okay, we'll do your very, very ornate organic pieces with the long, tiny bits of grass. Mm -hmm. That's all right for those. And that's really, that's going to crack everything. It's going to be a nightmare. You know, it's, yeah. you know you, if you put hot metal in a mould, it'll open up and create loads and loads of cracks. Yeah. And you, so I get nervous about that. <laughs> they go, no, it'll be all right. I go, really? Yeah. Go, what do you say, boss? I go, oh, okay. Yeah. I don't do that. And then if it's too cool, you won't get those grasses because the metal won't pour. Right. So there's this incredible tightrope. Yeah. So all Thin this line. skill and this knowledge, and each foundry has its own you know, tolerances and levels, mm. and these guys yeah. devise and design all this, yeah. and all the parameters they stick in the bronze, and they wait and wait and wait for the right moment. Mm -hmm. yeah, we really should be pouring and going, wait, no, we really right. should go, come yeah. on, there's 200 <laughs> kilos of metal, we've got to pour. Yeah. Wait, you know. So it's all that kind of um, knowledge. Yeah. What's been built up? Yeah. yeah. Productivity in the foundry is going to be slack today while everyone's pen and alert saying we've done pay rise. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> Luckily, they're not interested in me. They won't be watching this. <laughs> they're sick to death yeah. of me talking. Yeah. Sick yeah. to death of it. They, I just oh, bored them rigid. But they're damn good people, you know. Yeah. Are they all local then for where you. Well, no. Uh, one travels up from London. The Italian travels up from London, 
And so I've got two studios. One's an old fire station, and I've made a bedroom in it. There's, there's like three, two bedrooms in it, so right. they stay in there for three nights right. and work half a week for me. Oh. And then most of others have moved back from London, from colleges in London and stuff, mm -hmm. and have made their lives there. Yeah. So they become local. <clears throat> yeah. It's very exciting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So when you left school, what did you want to do? I well, I got. Um, it's a my life story now. We didn't finish, thank God. Yeah. No, I was. I didn't do too well at school. I came away with very few qualifications. That's so me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I thought I was. I thought, when they came through. <laughs> I thought, I'm brighter than this, surely. <laughs> <laughs> They're going wrong. Yeah. You know, I thought, this is not, this is not, this is not, this is not right, is it? I got art, and I got a, an E in history. I did like grade CSE, five, fail, U for maths. Yeah. I thought, anyway, so all I could do was either join that. It sounds terrible, isn't it? I was yeah. a cadet in yeah. the Navy. I said, I could either yeah. join the Navy or go to art, go to third, like Doncaster here, like go yeah. to an art college in Lowestoft. Yeah. Further education, you know. So that's what I did. Yeah. And that was the amazing, most amazing time of yeah. my life. I was turned on to yeah. art. Incredible lectures there. Yeah. And um, really radical, quite left wing as well. And um, then I did a degree, got into a degree, right. which is amazing. I couldn't believe my luck. Mm -hmm. And before you knew it, I was in the foundry there. There was a foundry. So yeah. at the age of 18, I discovered bronze. Right. Couldn't believe the mixture of materials, the incredible ornate yeah. process. And you know all this liquid going hard business, and all this extraordinary wax, plaster, metal, welding, grinders, yeah. fire. It was just <laughs> every possible human experience was all wrapped up in one. Yeah. As well as all this, you know, as well as all this modelling. So it's very, very exciting. And so yeah. I've, I've been doing it since I was eighteen. Right. Yeah. Oh Jesus Christ! What time are we supposed to finish? Well, I don't think it's going to get any better. They'll blame it on you for talking, Steve. I know what his family's on about. There you go. I don't know if you recognise yourself. I'll have to have a picture of it. Fantastic. Yeah. Gosh. Incredible. Incredible. It's very interesting the way you've been sitting. Right. Yeah, please. Yeah, and we'll see how I'll take one. Because yeah. you're obviously, this is um, Joan, she was sitting like, you know, she had a back. So the neck goes into the back. But that's right. the back of an 85 year old. It's interesting. Yours was a. I'll take it. I'll get you in yeah. Yours I'll is get, a fit one. back. Yeah. 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 I said my eyes look. Uh, I know you'd you'd remarked about it saying that yes. the eyes, and I'd never oh, something yes. could, I'd noticed it until you were pointing it out yes. on the actual screen uh, how my eyes were different. Yes, I'd never ever noticed that. Yeah, and that was my son when it came up. He was. Chinese artist and he took about six pictures and none of them have come out because it's just flared back up every really? single one and he was sat there taking pictures like oh, mine no. and not one of them had come out so I, so I emailed Dan and said the only chance that I could because he wanted a yeah, copy of my son and not one of them had come out <laughs> it was just all flare <laughs> fantastic that was a beautiful photograph yeah yeah mm -hmm. but it's very difficult because if I was doing a sculpture of that photograph I would have got that yeah in reality you, they're much more they are much more even. But in that photograph, there was this incredible what you called duality. A bit there was yeah. two, those two beautiful yeah. sides of your personality, really. Yeah. Um, but even when you're talking animated all the time, yeah. you know, you're quite, it's Changes. great, and yeah. your face is constantly moving. So yeah. one's trying to pin down things, yeah. like your mouth, for example, is very vague because it's moving all the time. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, there's much more animation in your eyes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's been brilliant. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks really ever so much. A natural and lovely <coughs> session. There's a nice unevenness in the ear, which is great. But this, this ear is much yeah. wider than that one. So 
creates, you often want to get asymmetry in the head. Mm -hmm. You want to get away from evenness. Yeah. Uh -huh. Gives you the opportunity. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Into the water. Right. <laughs> now, how long will it be in there for? I'll be back Friday afternoon. So it stops in there till then? They'll stop in there in the, around the back of the van. Right. And then they'll drive back, and they'll probably be in there till each one is made a mold of, so in a couple of weeks, some of them. Right. Yeah. And nothing will happen to them in no, the water? No, they're in perfect, that's right. a perfect place for them. Right. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Oh, great, Steve. Oh, Thanks, Steve. Oh, we did it again. <laughs> <laughs>